Greetings, brothers and sisters from around the world. Pull up a chair. It's time to get down to the business. I am your host, your brother, your humble servant, Mr. Jason Black. Glad to be with you all again here for another edition of The Business. And this is going to be an important one because before other people have the opportunity to corrupt what you've been given, before they have an opportunity to mess it up, before they have an opportunity to distort it beyond all recognition, you should have a place that explains exactly what is important and why. In clear, concise, easy to understand language that you will all be able to transport to other people. And that is a very important aspect to maintain. Because one of the things that has happened here is the language has been bastardized. It has been corrupted it has been distorted beyond all recognition and it is important that we do what is necessary to make sure that you understand exactly why this can't be allowed to happen so what we are going to do here is we are going to discuss with you all why it is that so-called toxic masculinity is great And what I want for you all to do here is I think it's very, very important you all share this broadcast. As my mods are saying in the chat room here, make sure that you share this. You want to share this. You want to share this. Very, very important because this is going to be a critical lesson that we are going to have here tonight. First and foremost, we are going to discuss step by step why so-called toxic masculinity, and I'm I'm not going to shade the language on it here. We're going to go straight up the middle. But we are going to talk about why it is that it is important. Why it is that it matters, and not just why it matters, but why it is that in actuality it is great. It's not just good. It is essential. It is absolutely essential. Because a lot of you have been told there's something wrong with being masculine. You've been told that masculinity can be toxic. And I'm here to correct those misnomers for you here tonight. Starting first and foremost, we are going to discuss number one, why why toxic masculinity is great. First and foremost, because masculinity doesn't fear death. This one is going to be difficult for some people to accept the reality of and the greatness of and don't get it confused. You see, we've been told that we are toxic because masculinity makes us unafraid of death, either to die or to kill. But understand that a person who isn't afraid to die also isn't afraid to kill. And while this trait can make us the most dangerous, it's also the one thing that makes us the most safe. The mother is the nurturer. But we are the protector because we are not afraid to stand between our family and death and still hold the line. That is what defines a masculine being. We defy death. We do not just see it. We do not just understand it. We defy it. We hold the line and stand even in the face of death. We do not back down. The woman gathers the children and runs. The man faces the threat and stands. Because masculinity does not fear death. We are the revolutionaries that governments can torment and torture, hold us in prison for decades, threaten to execute us, and we march to the gallows with our resolve intact because we know that few people will remember if you beat death, but everyone will remember if you ran from it. And the masculine, 
knows that it defines itself by its ability to overcome death and the fear of it. The reason that we build skyscrapers, we work in the mines, we do all the heavy, dirty, dangerous labor is because our masculinity is defined by our ability to defy death. That if greatness is to be achieved and the price of it is to risk death, the masculinity intrinsically leads us to face death. That if that's the worst that can happen, then we will proceed. We do the jobs that women are afraid to do because by nature, women understand that putting your life on the line by going 80 stories in the air to build a mammoth structure, even if everyone is going to benefit from it, is inherently dangerous. You can't be a pregnant woman and risk your life. And even without a baby in your womb, the elements are too much except for the strongest and the most selfless. And that is The masculine. When you talk about these fishing boats that go out onto the seas and and, and for time immemorial, sailors have been men because when the earth throws waves at, at shipping vessels, it doesn't matter about your egalitarian society. The laws of physics will determine if you die and drown. Your desire to be a female sailor is not going to save you from the crashing waves and the high winds blowing you overboard to your death. In those situations, you need the strongest and the most selfless, and that is the masculine. And what defines masculinity is that we are not afraid of death. And that is why our lives matter more than our deaths because we do not let death intrude on our responsibilities. We don't let death intrude on that. We stay focused. We stay focused and that is a difficult thing to do for others, but for us it is second nature. It is first nature because it is our genetic intrinsic responsibility. The women and the children sit and look in us at all. Because while they were unable to concentrate, we were able to do so. While they were scared of death, we were busy staring it down. Which is what we've always done. Next, masculinity is defined by sacrifice. A man is defined by that which he does without. Indulging yourself and becoming fat and sloppy, that's easy to do. A man is defined by that which he does without, that which he withholds. He does not, in, he is defined by his ability to delay gratification or to bypass it altogether. The women are the soft beings. The children are the fragile beings. The men are not. Sacrifice is an essential element of masculinity. We've been told that we are toxic because masculinity makes us harsh and makes us do without Instead of enjoying the comforts, masculinity leads us to be prickly and uncomfortable. And we make other people uncomfortable around us. But a man is defined by what he produces for others, not what he produces for himself. A man's value comes from what he has contributed to the society, not by being a dependent on it. The reason that men are given the responsibilities of leadership is because we also carry the burden of ensuring the safety of our followers. And that's everyone else to make sure that everyone else has, even if and when we don't. 
You see, while the woman might provide for the child and she might say that she sacrifices for the child, she is sacrificing out of that which the man has provided for her and the child. He, she is sacrificing out of that which has been produced and provided to her by the men. The house over her head, the clothing on her back, the food on her table. Th these were all produced by the masculine psyche that demands to define itself by what it gives up. It's been said that to whom much is given, much is required. But by the same token of whom much is required, much is owed. And sacrifice has been required of the masculine. Sacrifice has been required of us. That is what we have to deal with. Sacrifice is required of us from the day that we are born because you cannot be masculine without it. You cannot be masculine without it. So understand that sacrifice is intrinsic and it makes some people upset it makes some people worried it makes some people feel some kind of way but that is what makes us masculine beings and then you turn around and call that toxic that is an insult and a slur to look at those who have sacrificed for you and to say that their capacity to do so which is a difficult thing to do is toxic and then once they do not sacrifice for you, then you wish to condemn them for it. Next, masculinity does not respect weakness. We've been told that we're toxic because masculinity makes us demanding of ourselves. It makes us demanding of others. It makes us uncompromising in what we do we've been told that masculinity is uh, masculinity is toxic under those circumstances but understand masculinity knows that the life we enjoy today is the result of the men who came before us who sacrificed before us and most importantly they knew that we were their children and they would not make excuses for why they didn't give us a better life. And now we owe it to our children to do for them what was done for us. When a child falls and scrapes his knee or fails to pass the test in school, the mother will come and pick him up and make him comfortable with his failure and soothe him in his failed condition. The masculine demands more. The masculine understands that children cannot be protectors and providers. Therefore, we don't seek to infantilize the children. Children need to be protected as babies. Babies are helpless. Babies are fragile. But you are not here to remain a baby. It is the masculine that leads you into the world of leadership, protection, and provision. And that is very uncomfortable for the feminine because the feminine has invested itself in, quote, protecting you. The masculine is that which teaches you to risk everything, including death. The one thing that the feminine cannot bear to see that which it is cared for endure. And the masculine is willing to lead you into that every time because that is your duty and that is his. Only adults can be protectors and providers. So when the child falls as the masculine, we don't ask him why he fell. We don't ask him why he failed. We tell them that we expect them to stand up and keep going because if the boy makes excuses to his mother, then when he becomes an adult, he will make excuses to his family. He will make excuses to his children. He will make excuses to the rest of the society. Masculinity understands that our family, our children can't eat your excuses. They can't wear our excuses. Our excuses won't give them shelter from the elements. We understand that if we 
fail if we bring excuses, people die. That is the price of delivering excuses. If we hand off excuses, then people will die. Which is why we have we cannot accept excuses. We cannot accept weakness. When you have a male who comes to you with feminine traits, the feminine is soft. The feminine is giving. The feminine is submissive. The masculine is hard. The masculine is rigid. The masculine is uncompromising. The masculine cannot protect if it is soft and submissive. The masculine is able to protect because the masculine is hard and coarse and does not compromise. And the feminine intrinsically submits to that because it understands the necessary difference. As men, we do not respect weakness. The masculine being does not respect weakness because weakness never protected anything. So it is intrinsic. We have a guttural reflexive reaction to weakness as masculine beings. Your inability to sacrifice, your fear of death, we see these all as weaknesses. Because you are prioritizing yourself and saving your sniveling life above your duty to the people. We've been told that we are toxic because we demand to be respected at all costs. Now, if you want to see us get up in somebody's face about something, let them start disrespecting us. Let them not show proper respect. And then you see, we've been told that's a toxic thing. So what they're really saying is that we should be accustomed to not being respected. Let me tell you something. A man who is not respected is not a man. A man who is not respected is a dog. And a dog will come and hug on its owner, even when the owner makes him eat off the floor, even when the owner makes him sleep outside, even if he sells off the dog's offspring, the dog will continue to do that. A dog comes back and shows affection to those who disrespect him because he has no definition of respect. But a man, a man overcomes his fear of death, overcomes the discomfort of sacrifice, overcomes the temptation to give excuses for weakness and failure because he defines his being by his ability to have his women and children and the other men who see him and look on him with admiration and esteem. He does all those things because respect is the ultimate reward for the masculine being. Not hugs and kisses and flowers and the veneration. No, no the, the respect of the people that he sacrificed for and succeeded for in the face of adversity and even died for that respect that you are given. No ticker tape parades required. No monuments need to be done. As long as he knows he has the respect of the people, there is no higher reward than to know that the people who see you look upon you with admiration. They look upon you and say the most valuable words that can be said to a man's mind, to a man's ears. I want to be like him. I wish I could be like him. There is no higher honor. There is no higher honor. Understand that. There is no higher honor. For a man, respect is the pinnacle. There is nothing above it. And you have been deceived into thinking that there is something higher than that. You have been deceived into thinking that men require something less than respect. And that is not the way it works.
You are not going to water down what is our reward for giving our blood, sweat, and tears. That is what we have given our everything for, and we do not require anything more than to be respected. It is a small thing. It is a pittance. It is everything, which is why so many people do not want to do it. Respect is essential. And you have been told that there's something better than respect, such as this intangible, indescribable, undefinable thing called quote unquote love. You have been told that what the feminine values is what you should value. You see, the feminine values the love of a man because the love of a man can lead him to do irrational things on her behalf. It is in her interest. But the she needs that connection because there is nothing that she can actually do for a man that he cannot do for himself. That's the difference. There is nothing that you can that she can do for him that he is unable to do for himself. She understands this. She understands that. As men, we value respect. We value respect. We value it because we understand what that means. Masculinity understands that there's power in a name. Let me tell you something. There's power in a name. Masculinity knows that there is power in a name and it takes that power seriously. It takes that power seriously. Boys raised by single mothers don't respect their own name. They don't see any esteem in it. They haven't had a man tell them the responsibilities and the powers that come with his name. So since he sees no value in his name, he's willing to give his genes and thus his name to any stray alley cat female who wanders by. He has no respect for that name. Boys raised by masculine men have respect for their names. They understand the power in their name. They understand the, the responsibilities and the weight of legacy. They understand that. They value that. There is power in your name, but if you don't think your name is worth anything, then... No wonder respect means nothing to you. No wonder you're looking for love. You're a male defining the world on feminine terms. You are looking to be coddled and protected and provided for and secured like the females. Understand you cannot be respected under those circumstances. That is not a man's position. That is not what the masculine does. Lastly here, masculinity loves women and womanhood. Now, I know many of you thought this is actually where I would start, but this is actually where we end. Because masculinity begins with us. It doesn't begin outside of us. It begins with the characteristics within us and everyone else benefits as a result. But let's deal with this female aspect of it. We've been told that we're toxic because we love actual women. And to sow this seed of poison in the minds of young boys or young girls or people is a sickness and a disease. Now, to be clear, every woman wants to be adored 
And the women who say that masculinity can be toxic, well, we all understand these are the women who have failed to get men to value them. Because the truth is that they are women who are not worthy of being adored or respected. And since they can't have the same adoration from men that other women get, they've decided that they will tr attempt to destroy manhood. That if they can't enjoy the fruits of what masculinity blesses women with, then if they can't have it, no woman will. And that is the suicide mission that the Tyranna Burks and her ilk have embarked on. That since she's not eligible for masculine value and attention, she's never going to be eligible. Then damn it, if I can't have it, no one will. If I'm not eligible, no one's eligible. If I can't get it, no one can get it. So they dedicate their lives to destroying that which they cannot have. The real issue is that we've been told that there's something wrong with us. When in reality, there's something wrong with the rest of the world. The world has forgotten why it needs us. The truth is that as men, we did our jobs as protectors and providers well. In fact, we did our job too damn well. We made the world so safe and secure that we allowed the very people that we put our lives on the line for to protect and provide for to openly challenge us and speak against us with contempt. We stop demanding the respect that our sacrifices require. And as a result, the world has grown slothful and lazy because our masculine traits that you call toxic today provided the world that you now enjoy and take for granted. And you take it for granted now because you've never been threatened with having it all taken away, which is exactly what would occur without raw masculinity to get up every morning and continue ensuring your survival, Tarana. The solution is not to make you comfortable disrespecting us. The solution isn't to convince you that masculinity will change to appease your sick, contaminated, man-hating soul. The solution is for men to proudly stand up, take our place as men, and continue to provide and protect and demand respect, first and foremost among ourselves. Because you see, femininity requires raw masculinity. It requires it. So raw masculinity, masculinity isn't just great. Toxic masculinity isn't just great because of me or what I say or because of men. It is great because of females. Femininity requires raw masculinity because it's impossible to define the feminine without the masculine. The feminine has no value without the masculine. Femininity has no value to other females, as evidenced by Valentine's Day or Galentine's Day. Females do not value femininity. Males do. The masculine does. That's why silly people today tell you that a man or a woman, uh, a man can be a woman or that masculine and feminine are social constructs when in reality we all know they are immutable laws of the universe. They're immutable laws of the universe. It is not up for debate or conjecture. Only those sad, pathetic beings that have failed at being men, at being masculine, or at being feminine, only they are trying to tell you that masculinity can be toxic. The world was built by masculinity, toxic and otherwise. Your daily bread is given to you by masculinity. 
toxic or otherwise. Your physical safety is ensured by masculinity, toxic or otherwise. When something goes bump in the night, the woman isn't going to get up and go see what it is. The woman is going to, if she does get up, she's going to go see about the children. She is not going to run into the waiting jaws of death to stare it down. She will be expecting the man to do it. And any man who would sit in the house and say, look, I'll go look after the children. You go see what that was, what that is making noise downstairs. If she is so fortunate as to survive that evening, that will be the last time that she has that man with her. And even Tarana Burke in her sick, diseased psyche will tell you the same thing. She understands the need for masculinity. She understands the need for it to be toxic. She understands the need for it to be unforgiving and uncompromising. We cannot allow females to define for us what is masculine. Any more than the females can have the males define for them what is feminine. The laws of nature and being define those things. And anyone who tells you that masculinity is or can be toxic is articulating to you that they have declared themselves to be an enemy of men in general and society in specific because they want to tear it all down. They need to tear it all down. Because they are the misfits and the broken and they hate the fact that they are on the outside looking in. Our job is not just to have them on the outside. Our job is to keep them on the outside. Now and forever. That is our job. Masculinity is not toxic. Masculinity is great. Masculinity is rough. Masculinity is difficult to deal with. Masculinity is harsh. And it should be. And it should be. Masculinity is a tough pill to swallow. And it should be. It is supposed to be. Masculinity is rigid. Masculinity is harsh and it should be because you see survival isn't something you can compromise on. Survival isn't something that you do if you feel comfortable doing it. Survival isn't something that you that that you can make excuses for. When it comes to protecting your children, you don't have the option of saying, well, if it goes well, that's great. And if it don't, well, that's great, too. No, it isn't. No, it is not. It's not great. It's not okay. You will not be respected for it. You most likely will not be able to live with yourself over it. You can't be respected and esteemed and admired when your life is full of failures, full of excuses, full of you and yours being killed and hurt and and, and, and living at the bottom. There is no way that you can be respected under those circumstances. If you wish to be respected, if you wish to enjoy those things, if you want to know why it is that men occupy a leadership position, it is because we have to pay the price in order to have that. First and foremost, starting with being willing to sacrifice everything. That is a core key component of masculinity, which is why so many people wish to kill it. So many people wish to kill it. Because they see what it does. We are not your toys or your playthings. You will not turn us into your teddy bears. We are grizzly bears. You will not turn us into your toy dogs. We're wolves. You are not going to turn us into playthings. Masculinity is not here for your amusement. It is here for the protection and the providing for the people and the species. 
but it is not your toy. However, that is me on this. You may feel differently. So we're going to go ahead and open up the telephone lines. The number is 646-787-1933. That's 646-787-1933. Your personal access code to the business. On tonight's program here, we have been discussing why, quote, toxic masculinity is great. Not just good, not just cool. And yes, I'm using the words why it is great. It is great because as people, this is why you have the society that you do, that has afforded you the freedoms and liberties that you have, and why it is that you have an orderly progression from one generation to the other. And you have been told and conditioned to think that there is something wrong with masculinity. So they have tried to create this slur that masculinity can be toxic. Those are people attempting to control you and dominate you and ultimately to submit you. So they want for you to tell yourself that masculinity is toxic. And in the process the first thing you will do is look to them and say, well, I wouldn't want you to think I'm toxic. So can you define masculinity for me? Can you define it for me? And once you outsource your concept of yourself to someone else, you have now become their mental slave. You cannot outsource your concept of who and what you are. You cannot do that. But enough from me. We're going to go ahead and take a few telephone calls here. Let me get caller from area code 912. You're on live with the business. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Okay, caller from 912 is supposed to be on the line here. Let me see. Give me just a moment here. Let me go ahead and get them up. I need to get them back on the line here. Uh, Blog Talk is doing a little bit of a mistake on that, but that's quite all right. Everybody who's calling in, you're all on the line, so you all can hear me. Just need to go ahead and uh, you all are going to be able to hear me here in just a few moments. We just need to go ahead and get them straightened out for that, so... All right, we got Blog Talk back on here now, so you all should be able to hear me here. Let's go ahead and try them again. Let's get caller from area code 912. You're on live with the business. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Mr. Christopher from Savannah, Georgia. Christopher from Savannah, Georgia. What's on your mind? Yeah, um, speaking on the subject tonight, first of all, B1 to you and the family, Miss Steph and Miss D. Tubman. Um, yeah, like when you say toxic masculinity, like at work, for instance, like I'm more direct. I don't come with the soft shoeing and the, the bowing down and the knee licking and boot kissing. I'm more direct because these folks can't be trusted. You know what I mean? So, like, a lot of times, like, they come at me. I'm more direct. And then when we be in our meetings, because I'm on the leadership team, so when we be in our meetings at the round table, they be, oh, well, Mr. Christopher, you, you, you know, people, people are afraid to talk to you. And I'd be like, well, who is people? You know, nobody ever came to me. Well, they're afraid to talk to you. Well, why are they afraid to talk to me? Well, I don't know. Well, let's leave people names out of it. If you can't give me no names then leave people out of it, you know, I can't help them direct and you know, I'm, straight to the business, you know, because I use a lot of the, the talking points you be using, T, TBA, and it helps me because before I didn't know how to articulate it, but now I know how to articulate it without all that aggression. So I'm more smooth and direct with it than I am when I used to be. And, like, just for, just for a quick, 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 quick example, I got suspended with pay last month. I, I sent you this information in – um the um, Patreon and man, they couldn't even explain why they did it, but kind of find out they just needed a break from me because I was too toxic 
Well, I mean, folks are going to express to you that if once you are in their zone and everything, just understand that people are going to bow to whoever the strongest personality is. That's what they're going to bow to. And that's what you need to be aware of is just understand if they feel some kind of way, because it's black men in particular. We've been told every time we turn around, folk are telling black men that we need to soften up everywhere we go, everywhere we do. I've I've told you all for years that the greatest lie people have tried to tell out there is that black males are dangerous. I'll be damned. You got Negroes going around buying thongs and underwear at Lenox Mall. How dangerous is that? Mm -hmm. We've been told that as black men, we're the only men on the planet who are constantly having it drilled into us that we need to do less, be less. We need to stop being such manly men. Even though we see how everyone positively responds to it, we're told that that's a bad thing. So just understand when people are saying, they're not saying that you're dangerous because you're bad they're saying that you're dangerous because you're too powerful thank you very much for giving us a call night and remember your power cannot be taken from you now that is a key element that i want you all to understand your power isn't something that other people can take from you as a man as a black man your power cannot be taken from you they have to convince you to surrender it they have to convince you to give it up they, they can't take it from you. They have to convince you to give it up, to surrender it on your own. Let me get a caller from area code 414. You're on live with the business. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Yes. Hello, Jason. My name is Abel Tamanji, and I'm calling from Maquan, Wisconsin. All right, Abel, and what's on your mind? Yes, so... I wanted to uh, say that so far what you've said is 1,000% spot on about uh, quote-unquote toxic masculinity. And it got me wondering uh, because I wanted to add to what you just uh, said. Um, so a couple, a couple days ago, uh, I stumbled across an article well, it's actually not an article, but a page, and this might shock you, uh, but if you can hear me out, uh, you'll okay. probably see what Let's, I'm Okay, um, here's it. the thing here. The issue I want you all to understand is that one of the things we have as black males is that when folks open up a phone line or something and give folks a floor, some folks think it's their time to give a sermon. So I need everybody listening here. Get to your point within 15 seconds or less. We don't have we don't have the ability to give everybody the opportunity to give us a 30 minute lecture. So can you sum it up in 15 seconds or less? I'm sure you can if it's that important. Oh, yes, I can. Yes. So um, even the Black Lives Matter move movement, um, they took down their page a couple of months ago from what we believe. And basically, to sum it all up, it's about uh, attacking the men, uh, de- de- destroying the nuclear family, uh, all of the things that, that you talked about and pr- promoting um, other ad- agendas that go against uh, what you talked about, which is masculine versus feminine. Well, thank you very much for giving us a call here tonight. Um, well, absolutely, I can see how that would happen. Let me get a call from area code 908. Let's be a little more germane, folks. You're on live with the business. What's your name? Where are you calling from? <clears throat> yeah, what's going on? This is Cam from Elizabeth, New Jersey. Okay, Cam from Elizabeth, New Jersey. What's on your mind? Yeah, mo- first and foremost, I want to give respect, Black First. I've been listening to your broadcast for some time now. Um, first and foremost, I just want to touch base on what you said. You said masculinity respects femininity. And people need to understand femin- to have respect for femininity is not to suck up to it, not to be a simp. You know, um, there's no excuse to be a simp and to submit to femininity because me, myself, I grew up in a household with three women and my father was locked up. So that didn't stop me from putting my foot down and saying, look, I can't submit to the mentality and the philosophies 
of the women that I grew up around. I still have to have a sense of morality. I still have to have a sense of honor, of code, of respect for myself. And I noticed the men that these women in my family was bringing around wasn't worth shit. Excuse my language. Well, I, I want to let me talk about that for just let me talk about that for just a few moments, because you actually make a very good point. And this is something I wanted to talk about here tonight. Your resistance to that environment is biological. It's genetic. Right. Even if you take a, a male, no his, his masculinity is going to scream out against that. And there'll be a lot of them who can be broken, but let's just understand the resistance isn't coming from, quote, society. It's coming from your genes. It's coming from your blood. It's coming from your biology. It is coming from your masculinity. You are going to be sitting there, and even if you're right. raising and whatnot, you know this, this ain't right. You know this is not the way it's exactly. supposed to be. You know it even without someone there to teach you and to preach it to you, even without a Bible to to tell you that. You understand this is wrong. This isn't where where it's supposed right. to be. It's you genetic. you are starting to resist, and you are wanting to you are wanting to assert yourself and assert your masculinity in this 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 chaotic environment. Females without masculine leadership descend into self-destruction. That is right. the problem. And I wanted to touch Yeah, I wanted to touch base on that as well. Femininity, they're talking about toxic masculinity. Talk about toxic femininity where women in this generation we live in, they give rise to shame. They give rise to everything that's disregardable. We live in a slutatious generation where people worship women and you're supposed to worship your honor, your values. You're supposed to want to elevate yourself, not degrade yourself and demoralize yourself. That's all. Well, thank you very much for giving us a call tonight. Please do give us a call again. By the way, if there is anyone who disagrees and they think that toxic masculinity is a bad thing, there's a telephone number on your screen. The number is in the description. You can go ahead and give us a call. The number is 646-787-1933. Well, the number's not in the description, but I'll put it there. 646-787-1933. That's 646-787-1933. Let me go ahead and get caller from area code 862. You're on live with the business. What's your name? Where are you calling from? How you doing, Jason? My name is John. I'm calling from Newark, New Jersey. All right, New Jersey's in the house. What's on your Can mind, you brother? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm in disagreement with you. And, and, and let me just say first, I, I agree with almost 85% of what you say, but it's that 15% of what you say that I don't agree with that I think makes a difference. Um, toxic masculinity is probably the thing that is destroying, destroying the black community. It is destroying the black community. And one of the reasons it's destroying the black community is because we cannot cooperate. We cannot cooperate. We cannot even have a conversation without a toxic type of masculinity rising its head okay so I'm, I'm, okay can, all right okay okay slow down slow is. down exactly what is it about tox about masculinity that you consider to be toxic give me a specific example because you're kind of rambling you're really vague well i'm really not rambling but you're really vague the problem which is is rambling. you didn't define you you didn't define toxic masculinity first so I, leaving, sir, excuse me, excuse me. me. Okay. I, I spent the first 35 minutes of the program going into withering details. So if you're telling me that you cannot comprehend the English language, then the problem is with your poor English okay. language skills. It has nothing to do with me. I, I went into specific right now, right line by line detail. You see what's happening? Okay. I you went into lot. What you're telling because me is that your lack of English skills, you're, you're saying that your lack of English skills, you consider that to be toxic if someone's no. literate and you're not. I, I, I have fun English. Skills. No, you don't, because skills. they're listed on your screen, and you said that's not. This was broken down to a third grade level, and you said I still can't understand it. That's a lack of intelligence. Because, the, because what you have written down, sir, does not is not thorough enough, and does not cover enough. It's ambiguous. 
So you're telling me that um, saying that uh, ma- masculinity doesn't fear death is defined by sacrifice, doesn't respect weakness, demands respect, that that wasn't specific enough for you? No, it's not. It's no. Because no he was about to say it's not Pacific. He was about to say it's not Pacific enough. He was about to say it's not Pacific enough. Yeah, he was about to say that's not Pacific enough. And by the way, sir, just, can, under, can, just understand, can, can there are, not, understand something. There are no men or no, and no women who are going to respect some fruit booty dude who's trying to use feminine shaming tactics. So you're really coming off very moist and feminine, and that's not really going to work. You can keep yelling toxic all you want to, dude. You're not shaming me, and I don't care if you think it is or not. So by you saying, you don't want to be toxic, do you? Dude, if being an illiterate baboon from New- Newark is to- is not being an illiterate baboon from Newark is toxic, I want to be radioactive. <laughs> this, guy, this guy. So you keep saying that over try and over. You're, try- you're talking like a black feminist is what you're talking like. So what this tells us is like he was raised by a single mother in the outskirts of the hood and he's really been effeminized okay. and when I talked about guys buying thongs he took offense because he was like hey wait a minute now I like my J-Lo underwear and I'm not going to take it off of you man no. but just understand you're using feminist you're using feminist tactics on a male and that's not going to work I'm not using feminist tactics at all I will go through all five of your talking points and show you why what you wrote you will go not through you will go through that nothing. That you will go through nothing. You will explain why the first one, masculinity doesn't fear death, was not specific enough for you. Because someone can be feminine and not fear death. Wrong. That doesn't, that, wrong. That doesn't make it wrong. A masculine trait. Wrong. You are wrong. You're just dumb and you're wrong. Period. Well, I'm not wrong at all. Yes, you are wrong. The feminine does not confront. I explained exactly what doesn't fear death means. This is not a matter of whether or not you are willing to die for your children. In the hierarchy, the women stand between the, the children and death. The man stands between all and death. And the woman expects the man to stand in front of her. You've never seen a woman who told the man, stand back. I will protect you from death. So you, my illiterate young friend from Newark, New Jersey, in the backwaters of the industrial wastelands, didn't understand that simple concept, (laughs) even though I spent 35 minutes explaining it in withering detail. And yet PBS and Sesame Street were unable to help you to understand that. See, you're being toxic. You have to insult me. That's not no uh, no whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not insulting you. I am not insulting you. I'm not insulting you. I'm not insulting you. I'm not insulting you. I'm not calling you names. I didn't I'm insult you. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Slow down. Excuse me. me. You're, you're not gonna talk me. you're not gonna talk over the host. I did not insult you. Let's just correct that right now. I did not insult you. I haven't insulted you one time. I'm simply reporting the news. You're the person who didn't understand what you were before you came here. I'm just reporting the news. That's all. These are facts. This isn't my opinion. Okay. You literally said that something mm-hmm. broken down to a second grade English level was too complicated for you. If you're a grown male, that just makes you an ignoramus. That's not an insult. That is simply just <laughs> defining your pathetic okay. state of intellect. That's all. I'm not insulting let's, you. Can we move on to the next point? There. We okay. The next point? We have because all. Wanna, we have let's, already. Let's, 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 we have let's, already let's, let's found the point. The point, the point is that you think that okay. a female is capable of doing what a man does. So you've already exposed your your basic fundamental flaw yes, in ignorance. I do. Okay. Because it's not objective. It's not universal. How many times does it take for something not to be universal? Okay. Or to be not name, universal? Name, for, name for me three physical things that a man needs. You, you, you excuse me, sir. I'm not going to talk over you. This is my program. You said that a woman is can do what a man does. Great. Name for me three physical things that a man needs from a woman that he cannot do himself. Um, Birth. Okay. You got one, but it, 
Okay. Now, now we need two more. I don't. I don't know the other two. All because right. To me, All right. Th- th- okay. Thank you. Really okay. Funny. Thank you. Now, would you like me to? Would you like me to start naming off the things that men are physically capable of that women simply cannot do? Would you like me to start doing that? I, I sure would. Yeah. We, no, he doesn't want us to do that because we'd be here for a while. I, I want you to do and it. By way, I want you to do it. And by the you way, and by the way, oh, by the way, back to that first example you gave. Can you show me a woman who can become pregnant without a man's assistance? That has nothing to do. Oh, with yes, it does. Yes, it does. Masculine. No, no. If you can show me, no, no, no. If you can show me, she, she can become pregnant by herself. No, 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 no. She has to get pregnant to give birth. So you have to explain to us, can she give birth without a man doing it for her? No. Oh, so there. So, so even the one example that your minuscule intellect was able to eke out of its cobweb interiors, even that one is wrong. So are you no, ready to? St- so are you ready to stop talking can- and stop embarrassing yourself yet? No, I'm not ready to stop talking. So you're, you're not letting me talk. You're not letting me form my talking points. You're not letting me make an argument. All right, everyone, everyone, I want you all to listen very carefully. I am going to give the baboon from Newark 60 seconds to make his the case. Baboon from Newark. I'm not going to say, okay. I'm going to start the clock going here. He will have 60 seconds. Go. First of all, femininity, femininity and masculinity are social constructions. They are not objective things. They are, there's, there's, there, there are things that we observe and that we, we say, oh, this is feminine and that is masculine. They're just social construction. There's nothing objective about it. Birth, giving birth is not a feminine thing. Um, impregnating a woman is not a, a masculine thing. It's just a, a, a fact of a biological fact. Furthermore, when we talk about masculinity being toxic, we are sticking to, I'm sticking to it's a social construction, okay? But what I'm saying about that social construction is that it is the part of masculinity, the social construction of masculinity, that contributes to maladjustment, okay? And this is the reason, and, and this has happened to us because of white supremacy and because of a lack of resources. We have become totally toxic. Everything is a competition, sort of like Jason is acting now. He is trying to have a competition with me. He is putting me down instead of having a productive conversation with me, which would be masculinity. White people do not do this. For the most part, they do not do this because, hello, Am I, are you still there? The baboon is hello? still, the baboon is trying to figure out if he can be heard or not. And by the way, you have had far longer than 60 seconds to spew your bilge, by the way. Now, everyone listen to me right now. I only have one question for the baboon. Can you explain to me what part of feminine culture today is toxic? There is, there are, there's plenty of feminine, a part of feminine culture that is toxic to that. I would 100% agree with that. Didn't ask, I, I, I didn't ask you if you think there is. I said name, I said, now name what they are. Now name what they are. Um, one of the things in femininity that is toxic right now is how women, um, are choosing mates. And how is that a sign of femininity being toxic? Materialism. Okay, you're not explaining well, what that has under- to do with femininity, you idiot. What does that have to do with being feminine? Do not call me an idiot. I did not call you any names. What See, does that have to do with not, femininity? And I'm not going to let you call me an idiot, okay? You're calling I'm yourself I'm one. I'm than you. you. So far, you have to be asked the same basic okay. questions. You can't tell us what this has to do with femininity. Fourth time. Well, you've asked, you've asked me a very open-ended question like you always do. 
Okay. You, you, you give it to these open-ended questions. Hang I'm still up. I'm still going to answer. Okay, sir, you are obviously a gay did lives you matter. You're you have, obviously you a gay question? lives you matter like individual, that and that's fine, but you cannot promote your gay lives matter position as being indicative of something intelligent. I'm not gay. So I'm do, not LGBTQ. Yeah, not, I'm not, if I'm you're not, guy. you'll do till they till Lil Nas X gets here. To Lil... What? If you're not the LGBT what? representative, you'll do till Lil Nas gets here with his Satan shoes. So do the world a favor. Okay. You have dropped the collective IQ of the room by about 30 points. It is time for us to unburden ourselves of your particular specific you flavor of ignoramus. You need to unburden yourself of the way you think, though. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the representative who says that masculinity is toxic. He doesn't, he can't, he told all of us that this was not specific enough. And the 35, 38 minutes of explanation that I went through at the beginning of the program, he says that that wasn't specific or detailed enough. That wasn't enough he needs more so if you all want to know what type of misanthrope look it up if you want to know what type of remedial flunked student is being produced by the new jersey public school system you just heard him there he was you just heard him in all of his pathetic splendor and glory there he was. Now, how many of you are in? I want to know how many women feel better by hearing what he had to say. I'm just curious. I'm curious how many women feel better about that. How many women feel like that's the kind of man they would want? Just curious about that. Oh, I'm sorry. Any females who would say that they didn't want him, he would say that you were being uh, that your feminism is toxic, even though he can't tell us why it's toxic. Even though he can't tell us. I want to do something a little bit different now. I want to do something a little bit different if I may. Yes, Let me see here. Do I have Eric on the line? This is Eric. How you doing, sir? All right. I've got Eric on the line here, and there is a reason why I wanted to speak to Eric here tonight, because Eric contacted me a little while ago. I've actually spoken to Derek previously, but I'm not going to go into that right now. Um, I haven't pre-screened this call or anything, but um, you said that there was something that you wanted to say, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to go ahead and say that so I can make a few minutes for you here. So what exactly was it you wanted to tell me? Yes, sir. So we talked about uh, almost exactly three months ago about me getting my getting my weight up. So you gave me a laundry list of things I needed to do. And as usual, it wasn't anything easy and it was do it all right now. Don't try to space it out. Do one thing at a time. Do it all now. So followed your advice. I went and got the second job working about 75 hours a week, still in school. Um, got my weight down, dropped about 25 pounds. So I'm from 220 to about 195. And I'm working on everything you said. So the credit, you helped me get my credit up for, in three months from 680. I'm sitting at about 720, 725 right now. Um, one mistake I didn't listen to you correctly on while we were talking, you said, hey, wait till your credit gets to about, and you gave me a number before I file for a Discover card. You told me, don't do it now because you, you're at the gray area. I did it right then and tried it anyway and got turned down. Mm. Waited a month and a half later. Yeah, yeah. Got, I got excited. Waited a month and a half later. They were, they were volunteering to give me a call. I got it to about 705. They basically gave away one with about $8,000 credit limit, which has only got 200 on it. So I'm not maxing out and I'm not going wild. So, um, yeah, I followed everything you said and I did it all then. The two-job thing, it hurts. But, oh, the, the, the payoff is, is more than, than worth it. Well, first of all, I'm very glad to hear that there. Second of all, I'm very glad you gave us a call about this. I am the only, the only, the 
only personality on YouTube or anywhere else that when I give people advice, I give an open call for them to call me back because everything that I tell you, I will stand by it. I will stand by it publicly. I will stand by it repeatedly. There is nothing that I advise you all about that I am afraid of you telling people that, hey, this is what Jason said because I stand on it. I don't just sit here and talk about women. I build men. And a lot of you have been denied information. You didn't have, you know, proper mentoring in it. And you're flying blind about these things. I will I will excuse you about the discover thing because you had some <laughs> irrational exuberance. It was just like, oh, hell, what he gave me is working. And then they, they kind of get impatient. But you're going to have to understand you didn't get overweight overnight. You didn't get in debt overnight. You didn't get bad credit overnight. You're not going to get out of this overnight. So one of the things that we have to understand as men, and this goes to what I was talking about here tonight, one of the things we have to understand as men is that masculinity is defined by sacrifice. You're not going to sit up here and just, okay, well, I, mentally I want this to stop happening. Because here's the greatest mistake that you can make as a man. The greatest mistake that you can make as a man is to tell yourself that discomfort is beneath you. That is the greatest mistake that a man can communicate to himself as a man, your ability to withstand. And I would dare to say your ability to coexist with discomfort that defines you, your ability. Understand something. I want you to be just as confident about yourself with a 550 credit score as with the 850 that you're going to have here in a little bit. I want you to be just as confident with yourself in either situation. Now, that doesn't mean that you settle for the 550, but that means that you have the same resolve at 550 because that's what's going to get you to 850. That's what's going to get you to do everything else. That is what gets you the second job and gives you the ability to endure is that you've walked in with the expectation. I'm not here to be comfortable. I'm here to be powerful. Not comfortable. That's a feminine trait to seek comfort. Because you can't have babies under harsh conditions. You can't care for babies on a battlefield. A man isn't supposed to look for comfort. A man is supposed to look for power. And the formulas I give you all, they will work. The rules I give you, they will work. So you're going to need to be patient. I'm glad you're able to get the second one there. You know, it's going to be, this being April, I'll talk to you then. You're probably going to be, you want to wait about at least another four or five months before you try to go for another one. Because remember, those inquiries start to pile up. And you don't really want right. a bunch of them in one year. So try to space them out. So I would recommend that you not, I recommend you give it a rest for a little while. Come back in the fall. Do it again. And then, you know, after you've gotten your call back and gotten your six month limits raised, do it in the fall, maybe get one more. But that's really kind of pushing it because right now you, right. you really need to start getting a track record under you because three cards ain't really going to help you a whole lot more than two cards at this point. But pace yourself. Take it easy. You got time. But more importantly, you've got the discipline. So before I let you go, Can I here, say something before we go, sir, sure. Uh, go ahead. So, you know, I was, I'm a single father also with my 14-year-old daughter, and we, I followed it. We didn't go out to eat for the full three months. Nowhere. We might have a quick burger or, or something like that, but nothing severe. So tonight the, crazy, the timing is crazy where because of the sacrifice that I had to put on her with the everything will be ate at home, no shopping, nothing, that, everything's got to minimize for at least six months. I took, we're well, right now, we're in the, uh, I'm in the lobby of the uh, Gordon Ramsay Steakhouse. It's, it's a celebratory time to show her that what sacrifice can get us. You know, so I, I want to thank you for that, man, because we've never eaten like this. We, and, it, and it's not a, I got paid yesterday, I can go splurge. You know, I can treat if I need to or to show her how things should go. So I really appreciate that whole new vantage and a whole new, I, I can only live once a month type deal. And I don't have to live every day of the month at the same time. Well, more than that, though, and I think we discussed this before, I want you to sit. I, I talked to this, to especially all my single fathers and whatnot, to the young men with children. I want you all to understand. I want you to give your children, and specifically your daughters, an example to follow. I don't want your daughters to have the idea that a man is Santa Claus. I don't want your daughters to have the idea that 
if she wants something that a man's supposed to just snap his fingers and there it goes. I want your daughters to have the understanding that it takes work to get these things. I want your daughters to have the understanding that it takes sacrifice to get these things. I want your daughters to understand it, it, it takes it. You're going to have to give up something. This wasn't free. This wasn't easy. This is something that had to be earned so that she can recognize a man who is willing to sacrifice and work for her because she saw her father do it. Now she knows exactly what that looks like. Hopefully gains an appreciation for it. I wanted to ask you one more thing here before I let you go, Eric. Was there anything that I told you that was inaccurate or has backfired or has not? I want you to think hard. Don't answer reflexively. I want you to think about this for a few moments. Was there anything that we discussed that was inaccurate, that was faulty, not reliable, vague, um, didn't go the way I told you it would go? The only thing was that you told me we were looking at six to nine months, and because I implemented what you said that weekend, I didn't wait two or three weeks. I started when we got off the phone like we discussed. Three months later, I've already seen tremendous gains. So the only thing that didn't work the way you told me was when I took the Discover card in my own hand, and it, it backfired on me. Besides that, everything went a little faster than, than planned, but exactly as you told me. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad about that. Um, I mean, the only thing I was inaccurate about is how long it would take, um, which I guess that's a good problem to have. However, by the same token, I want you to understand. And remember, you and I discussed about Chase and 524 and everything. Yeah. So in reality, you know, you, you don't want to move. I mean, it's okay if you move a little bit faster, but understand you're going to have to slow down now because right, if, right, if right. you have too many inquiries within 12 months, that'll, that will actually start hurting you. So, I mean, you can do it sooner, but just understand you're still going to have to slow down a little bit. Uh, no matter what right. happens, you're still going to have to slow down some. But the good news is you've seen it work, and now that you've seen it work, you got confidence in it. So that is the most important thing. Well, I want to thank you very much for giving us a call here tonight and let me know how it goes. By all means, check back with me in six months. I want to see how things are progressing. Will do. Hey, thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for giving us a call tonight here, brother. What makes me different? What makes me different is what you just heard on that phone call. He was one of the people he, he wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one phone call with me and whatnot. He wanted to get into specifics. And um, I, I told him everything I would do. I let him know what I know. I didn't give these vague general statements about you just need to get it together. Look, none of these other people are able to sit you all down and say, here's what your numbers need to be. Here's who you need to call. Here's the number you need to dial. Here's what you need to ask for. Here's what you need to wait for. And you're always going to have some morons sit up here and claim to you that they already knew and that this was general information. Here's the problem. If it was general information, then they would have their own channel and we'd be giving it out to people. If this was information that was just freely available and readily available, they'd be able to do that already. If this was information that was just freely available, they would have their own YouTube channel or their own Reddit blog or something. They'd have their own Instagram. They'd be doing it already. Do not be deceived by some clown telling you that this is information already out there. If it was out there, the other poser channels would be giving it to people because they would know, because they would move in these circles. If they really did deal with the people who are peak value and who already know the ropes, they'd be giving you this information already already this is what sets us apart in what we do here this is what makes us different this is what makes us the business let me get caller from area code 704 you're on live with the business what's your name where are you calling from hi this is latif i'm calling from washington okay what's your name again latif Hello, Latish, and what's on and your I'm mind? Yeah. yeah, I'm calling from Washington. Um, so as far as toxic masculinity, the way that I see it is that I don't think that there's anything wrong with being masculine. I think you have to be yourself, and you have to define what masculine and feminine is to you alone. I think the problem with toxic masculinity is that there's this facade of this big, you know, like media projection of it, and there's so much focus on it that it moves the collective of people against your weight. And I mean, 
it's just that's just what's happening. That's what's happening to everybody. Well, you know, here's the thing I want people to understand. Be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. And the truth of the matter is that people have gotten fat and sloppy and lazy. And they have begun to sit up yeah. here and take masculinity for granted. This is why you have women who think they can raise a son on their own. Because I don't even understand what masculinity is because as a woman, I wouldn't understand what it is because it's so much projection. I wouldn't know. You well, know, like I'll take a couple definitions from my parents, but then it's like up to me. And right now I'm, I'm going to tell you, I'm guessing. Well, okay. Let me, let me give you, I don't, know. let me give you an idea here. The reason why masculinity and femininity are not social constructs. Let me give you the first reason why masculinity and oh, femininity God, are not social right. constructs. <laughs> uh, oh. co contrary to what the uh, third grade dropout the from says, New York, New Jersey just, had to say. Just, yeah. <laughs> first thing I want you to understand is masculinity and femininity are not social constructs because of the laws of physics. Starting with the law of gravity. Okay. Case in point, when you have a flat tire, it doesn't matter how wonderfully the car is engineered, how nice it is, how great the tire repair tools are. This car still weighs a, t a metric ton. The wheel still weighs 30 or 40 pounds. You're not going to be able to negate the laws of physics by telling the laws of physics about your degree or how you feel equal to a man, you're going to have to get that car. And I got physically. the best example for that. Okay, I'll tell you straight well, up. I was okay, working at, wait um, a minute, Latisha, uh, wait a uh, second. It like a, We're hosting our program. It, ease up for just a moment Oh, my here. bad, man, my I'll, bad. Yeah, I'll go I'll ahead. Let you, ease for <laughs> a moment. Bad. But the laws of physics are going to determine that. You can not like the lugs on your car as much as you want to. If you can't, muster the physical strength to get those lugs off of your car if you're stranded on the freeway somewhere that car and you are going to sit it doesn't matter about your political leanings it doesn't matter about your social philosophy it doesn't matter about what you read in history nope. books and how you feel about your i'm gonna pay that 400 dollars to get that bitch tax you well, know they take it out of there so it is what it is that's <laughs> that's a good <laughs> idea that's a good idea but here's the real issue most people, and I've done programs about this on the Black Channel, most people do not have a spare $400. So that's a wonderful aspiration. I'm sure my audience is probably above average. But the bottom line is okay. you're going to have to have the physical strength to deal with that. You can purchase a refrigerator, but if you cannot get the refrigerator in your home, it will sit on your clothes and leave it on the porch, and that's it, unless you pay them extra to bring it indoors if you want that. Same with your furniture. What I'm saying is that if you have something that needs to be physically done, the laws of physics on this earth are going to be more taxing on a female than they are on a male. Getting things done will always, mm -hmm. will always, will always be more difficult, more uncomfortable, and more unpleasant for a female to do than for a man. It will always be that way. And you would say that psychological too, right? Well, I mean, like you would say that psychological too, certainly right? Certainly, if I mean, uh, certainly, just for example, I mean, if there's a storm that comes through your area and knocks a tree down across the road. You know, for when, what happens is what what the guy said here before I forget who said it, but the women just walk up and look at the tree. The men break out the equipment and start cutting it up. But and if you didn't have the equipment, the men are going to figure out how to move it. For example, let me ask you a basic question: What type of car do you drive? Okay. Right now, I got a Nissan Versa. Okay. Now, most females, most females drive an economy car or at the very most they drive if they have kids they drive a standard so you might have a nissan mm -hmm. versa a nissan altima a honda accord a chevy you know cavalier or cruise but that's those are the cars that females well those are the cars that females typically purchase now take a look at what men typically purchase if you're like me, you got a full-size SUV or a pickup truck. We got V8s. What I'm saying is that we have vehicles that are made for work or can do work, except for the mama's boys raised by single mamas who go off and go buy something flashy. And other than it can drive fast, but if work needs to be done, he's going to be just as stranded as the women are. So where men are concerned, there's a difference between the vehicles that we buy. So if you have a neighborhood full of women, you're going to have a neighborhood full of Nissan Sentras, Toyota Priuses and Honda Civics. 
And if something bad happens, you're all going to be equally stranded. Whereas with the men, it's practically guaranteed that one of us or two of us have a large vehicle that will, even if we didn't have power tools, we're going to be able to literally tow that tree out of the middle of the street with no one else coming. Mm. That's a difference in psychology. Well, that's a difference in psychology, but I want you to understand something. If you're sitting there and you're blocked off from everything and this, and, and you realize you don't have any tools or any way to deal with that, that's going to psychologically defeat you on contact. That's going to change the way that you think about the world on contact. So what you said is it takes a psychological, emotional, or you, have, it absolutely or you even does. have like the materials and shit, but you can't like break it down. You can't break down the tree or anything like that. Well, as a woman. even, you even, too. well, even if with you that, could, like, you make a very good it will point. Fuck with you, yeah. Even if you could chop the tree up now, what now you're dealing with great, big, huge, heavy sections of the tree. So even it. if you could yeah, chop okay. it up, you still have to physically remove it. And your Prius doesn't have towing power your honda accord doesn't have think towing yep. power <laughs> it wasn't made that you, to me? you yep, got something right. that is nice and dainty and matches your lipstick and your shoes but it's not a work vehicle nor is it even able to improvise for it whereas typically men enter the equation you think of it as a child mover or a personal person people mover we think about is a work vehicle or at least it needs to be able to do some work so this is a fundamental intrinsic yeah. difference in the way in which because our cars are extensions of our personalities that's the real point your car is an extension of your personality oh, okay. so when you tell me you own a versa that tells me about your personality that says practical that says efficient that says she doesn't like to waste money but it doesn't say horsepower. Now, that's the one thing it doesn't say. But it tells me about your personality. Well, our vehicles yeah. are extensions of our personalities. We got vehicles that assist us in being who and what we are. So, yes, according the laws of physics are going to make a decision about that. That's exactly what will happen. And yes, it will take a psychological and emotional toll on you if you attempt to defy the laws of physics and pretend that they don't matter. Yes, it will. So, so it will matter, sure. I, but even let's say that, you know, psychologically, because women and men, we have to deal with the psychological aspect in, in battling life and, and confronting people and dealing with people and stuff like that. If, let's say, just use a woman, you're, you're dealing with men. I know you can't beat them. You're not going to be able to win. And I've had my thousands of conversations and trying to calm men down and, and, and having not to work with them and stuff like that. So the only thing I can think at this point is like at some point as a woman, you, you do have to understand, like you can't be offended by that masculinity. Like you can't be afraid of the, the steps that men will go socially, you know, with you, like you can't swap well, and then get understand, off. Understand, understand the women who are quote offend. So uh, supposedly quote unquote offended by masculinity you got to understand those are women who are not eligible for the rewards those are women who have screwed off their chances those are women who take masculinity or women who take masculinity for granted to the point that familiarity right. has bred contempt they're so used to men running to the rescue that they've actually developed contempt for us oh you're a given so it's like a I bratty think the problem child is we're taught that we're not taught to respect and and uh we're taught that you know men will come and help you like that's an expectation like that it's it's expected of you guys to be there for us but at the same no time matter it's, what. there's no expectation for the woman to be there for you as a man in general in any kind of way as like as a common being it's expected for men to come help me that's my mentality and it's not like to be like mean but the reason why it is like that is because i have to rely on you you know what i'm saying well, I mean, but the like other, the just, other part of I it, though, to. well, the other part of it, though, is that simps used to be an outlier. As men, we understood that chivalry was a two way street. And if you were an insufferable female, oh. you got left alone because remember, life expectancy used to be a lot shorter than it is today. 150 years ago, life and, and all the millennia before that human life expectancy was actually about half what it currently is half. So what that meant was that if you were a young female who was disagreeable, slick at the mouth, not cooperative, you would basically be left to die was what would happen. 
Why? Because Which is good to know where that comes from. Well, because as a kid, you get a lot of men that just like they throw you into that category and they start disrespecting you, you know, and then you got to fight your mentally. You have to fight your way out of that. Well, and that man. was my whole childhood. Well, I, I so certainly see like, there. So, you it, know, it's hard it's, to understand. That's what I'm saying, because you, you don't see it. That's it's understandable. Like, you pump the ga- pump the brakes a little bit. But yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Now, my bad, bro. When you said now you said you're from Washington, um, you're from Washington, D.C. or Washington State. I'm in Washington State. Okay. Um, when you're coming up to Washington, when you're coming up through Oregon, there's a mm-hmm. there's a spot on I want to say on 84. I want to say uh, Dead Man's Pass is what I want to say. I want to say there's I want to say this on 84. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I want to say there's a spot called Dead Man's Pass. And let me tell you something. You only have to pass that sign once for it to get your undivided attention. And the issue that we have is that we as men, we, we've, we've created a world now where we have allowed people, we've become so comfortable in our position as men and became Y'all so got quiet. Un, Y'all got quiet. We need <laughs> Well, we we became Y'all got so quiet, bro. We, needed we became like, so assuming yeah. of our position that our position was so unassailable that we started allowing some of the murmurs of disrespect to now cultivate and flourish into full blown insurrections in the streets. And simps used to be rare. Men didn't used to let themselves be so openly disrespected. Men used to lay down the rules and that was it. And it didn't even have to be done. It didn't have to be done forcefully or anything. It was just you comply or you are alone. Today, you've got males who sit up here and give children to women who don't deserve it. So in the process, he basically rings himself into being her involuntary protector and provider because he was raised by a woman Mm. who didn't teach him to value his name, value his legacy, value his genetics. So you have women who basically raise their sons to be male man servants to random disrespectful females. These random disrespectful females, some of them were raised in two parent homes. Some of them were raised in a few of them were raised in single father homes, but a lot, a lot of them they mm-hmm. raised two parent homes, but they have grown up in a culture of contempt for males for masculinity so on the one hand they appreciate everything it gives them but on the other hand they have contempt because everything has been given to them and they don't see what the price is so the most important thing that men could do today is to remind the world whether it wishes to hear this or not but to require of the world that there is a price in order for you to be gifted because you have the privilege not the right you have the privilege to our masculinity and if you will not pay the price you will not have it thank you very much for giving us a call here tonight let me get caller from area code 510 you're on live with the business what's your name where you're calling from uh, B1 to the fullest, Jason. It's Black Voltron coming out of West Oakland, California. Black Voltron out of West Oakland. What's on your mind, brother? Uh, what's on my mind is a side note. Uh, you know, I need to uh, you know, check that motherfucker from uh, New Jersey and shit. Um, I know this don't represent all of Brick City and Jersey, but that punk-ass nigga need to shut the fuck up and sit down because he don't know what the fuck he's talking about. And I seriously doubt that, number one, he's a man. Number two, he has any children. You know, just to get that out of the way. Um, number two, my main point is, as um, far as his toxic ma- masculinity bullshit, it's just that. It's bullshit. Now, there's no such thing as toxic masculinity. Never was, never will be. Look, um, at my uh, former job that I just uh, retired from, uh, my mom will say it, it's uh, Bart. Um, I worked in a department, elevator escalator department. Um, it was probably about three, three black folks in it. There's one white boy. This is a department of like 75% uh, black Asian. I mean, I mean, 75% um, white Asian and uh, Hispanics. Um, so one particular white boy decides to, uh, you know, continuously talk and disrespect uh, the four worker who happened to be an older black gentleman. Um, he kept doing it. He's been doing it for like the last year. And then one day I got sick and tired of the shit and said, who the fuck are you talking to like that? Now, fortunately, older gentleman, he, uh, you know, 
he didn't really want to say anything, but I had to step up and say something to him as a man, as a black man, because I got sick and fucking tired of seeing the disrespect. And I checked this white boy and said, you know, if you got a fucking problem with this shit, we can go up underneath the 880 bridge and, you know, we have a serious discussion about the shit. Bear in mind, this whole, you know, I'm in a meeting. And everybody in this meeting was quiet as shit. Nobody said nothing. But I'm that same dude that, number one, I'm, number, I'm, I'm damn good at what I do. I try to help out people when I can. But you don't fucking respect me as a black man, number one. And number two, I'm not going to let you dis- disrespect another black man, especially if he's our supervisor. So this punk-ass white boy decides, you know, he gets upset, he starts crying or whatever and shit like that. I'm like, you know, if you got a problem with it, let's just go up underneath the bridge and just talk about the shit. With your punk ass. The fuck you gonna do? He says nothing. I say all this to say this. We as black men need to take control of the situation wherever we at. We have to man up. We can't just sit there and act like a little bitch. And just assume that, you know, oh, I guess, you know, HR is going to take care of it. Supervisor is going to take care of it. This person is going to take care of it. That person is going to take care of it. No. We're the men. The same toxic masculinity, quote, unquote, that allows me to, you know, stand up and say, look, I'm not going to let you disrespect nobody. You damn sure ain't going to disrespect me. And you're not going to disrespect my family. Is is what's, what's needed in this war. I don't know where this soy boy bitch made you know, punk ass nigga mentality didn't came from, but it needs to end right now. We as the men need to step up. Well, I'll explain it to you. I'll explain it to you here. When 75% of your black boys are raised by single mothers, most of them being on some form of public assistance, white people are not other humans. They're gods. So they've seen their mama have to bow down and kowtow and she she talks smart to other black folk. But when the white folks show up, that's who she gets her wick from. That's who she gets her snap from. That's who she gets, you know, her Section 8 voucher from. That's who she gets her student loan from. So she sits there and dances a whole damn jig for them. So the example that the boys see is you smart off to other black folk. You have contempt for other black folk. When white folks show up, you just intrinsically get quiet. It's the plantation in modern form all over again. So if you want to know where that comes from, this idea that when white folks show up, you just naturally acquiesce. That's the seed of it. That's that's the germ of it, of where that came from in the modern era. They've been raised that when white folk enter the room, you have a change of attitude. And what you understood is that white folks see this. So they respond accordingly. They know that they created these conditions that's and that's why it serves them. So they are accustomed to the eye. This is what they talk about amongst themselves. This is why you got, you know, the Michael Rappaports of the world running around out there and things because they know the environment that they created and whatnot, and they are counting on it. They're counting on the programming because, and you know this, they know how black women act when they are alone with white men. Now, they know how they act when they're when we're, one of us is around, but they know how they react when they're alone with one of them, even if they don't tell us. So if we're ignorant about that, yeah, you can get taken by surprise with how people respond. But in reality, they, they've been taught this is a very young age. And, you know, for some of the older folk, it wasn't quite so common. But right now we're dealing with fully our second generation going on third generation of young black boys raised by single women who have told them that who have just shown them through their example, then there's no masculine example whatsoever. There isn't anything that dares anything. When I talk about fear of death, then we forget fear of death. They're afraid of getting written up at the job in, in, in that regard. So it never even makes it oh, that man. far. And now they're counting on it. Okay. But Jason, it's 2021. Okay. We haven't been in slavery for the last 170 years, all right? We've been through the black power struggle, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, 2010s. We're in the 2020s. We got social media, internet at our fingertips all over the place. Are you trying to tell me that right now black men are still scared? All of them? Uh, not, all, not all of them. I'm talking about an era. Not all of us, not all of us, but we have to understand we are, 
I mean, right now is the majority have. I mean, this this is something that was just before either of us were born. This train was already out of the station. Uh-huh. But the majority of uh-huh. black males today, I mean, for example, I mean, just think about this, dude. Where are they getting their masculine example from, period? I mean, we didn't remember, we didn't even have the Internet as a force 25 years ago. So when Spike Lee put out Malcolm X, you had Malcolm X and that on one hand, maybe Oprah on the other. But there wasn't a uh-huh. bunch of comp. There wasn't a Cardi B and a Meg Thee Stallion and Amigos and all this other chatter and nonsense. P- kids weren't going to the Internet to learn about their identity. So, yes, we do have this movement today where we are discussing it more openly. But just understand, we've this is a recent advent. This hasn't been there the whole time. We've been fighting a, a media complex and a government that's been subsidizing and backing it up now with literally trillions of dollars of investment to be able to maintain this warped, twisted view of things. So, brother, I mean, take a look what happened tonight. If you want to, you want, you, my answer to your question, that guy from Newark, when I said masculinity, take a look at what he did. So if you want to know what it is, that that's yeah. what we're fighting. There it is. It's very real. It's very much out there. And he's just one. He's just one. But, you know, when we were growing up, we, you know, I'm, I'm about your age, a little bit older. When, when we were on the yard, when we were in junior, growing up, junior high, high school, college, that metrosexual, punk-ass, bitch-made nigga type shit was unacceptable. Those were the rules. You, you, talk, you talk crazy to somebody, you getting socked in the mouth, period. You get knocked the fuck out. You know, if you want to, don't start, that won't be none. Or there'll be further consequences. You know, if you, if you persist. We had a code. Where well, did that code go? Now we got, to, I, now we got boys I, I raised. I project this on, on these young men. Well, we got boys you raised know, by females code. now. And, and the females have taught the boys that their footwear and keeping it pristine is more important than their, is a part of their dignity. So we got boys trying to protect their shoes as if they were a bunch of girls. Hell, even worse than the girls. That's what it is now. We're, we're, that's, I've taken it upon myself, you know, Judge Joe Brown and some others. We've taken it upon ourselves to try to reassert this and, and, and try to bring this back to the forefront. But make no mistake about it. We are, we are at the beginning of reversing this trend. We are not well along. The world that you and I were in, that world, for the most part, has been seriously compromised. And we're going to have to put them through boot camp and, and get that reasserted. Thank you very much for giving us a night call tonight. Bro. Let me get caller from area code 215. You're on live with the business. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Caller from 215. Last try. You're on live. Hey, this is Rasheed from Upper Darby. Okay. What's your name again? Rasheed. Okay. Rasheed from where? Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. Okay, from Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. What's on your mind? Yeah, honestly, TBA, I'm not where I want to be with my masculinity. So I just want to know, how do you gain confidence in that? How do you, like, build that up? Okay, so you're saying that you do not have confidence in your masculinity? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, first of all, let me find out a couple of things from you here. How old are you? Um, I just turned 26. Okay. Did you grow up with your father? Yes. Was your father married to your mother legally? Yes. Okay. Then why, how many siblings do you have? Um, about seven. Seven. Okay. Did your father have all those siblings about the same woman? No. Okay. Issue number one. What does your father do for a living? I think he's a manager, like a social worker, but like a manager. Lord. How many women do you have children by, just out of curiosity? Um, three. Three women. Was he married to all of them? No, he was just married to uh, my mother. He was married to just your mom, and he was, was he having outside babies, or were these children he had before he met her? He had one before he met her, and then he had one, he stepped out in the marriage. Okay. 
hell of an example to visit upon his sons. I want you to understand something. There are two ways in which our parents teach us things. They teach us either by their advice or their example. And I warn parents that your children will not follow your advice. They will follow your example. And you will learn from their example in one of two ways. You will either learn from what you follow or you will learn from what you resist of their example. And that's for everybody. It doesn't matter how quote unquote great your parents are. All parents have flaws. All parents have shortcomings. Some a hell of a lot worse than others. I want you to understand that there are certain aspects about his example that you will have to make it your mission to reject and resist because it does not, it doesn't, it doesn't have anything good to give you whatsoever. The reason why you are calling me and asking the questions that you are is because your father's attention, let me guess, your father was actually tending to these other children. Obviously, what I'm saying is he didn't disown them. It wasn't like he never saw them. Well, he left one in Liberia, so he didn't really talk to the one in Liberia. Okay. This Negro was a degenerate. Okay. What this t- and then this is a this is a illness among black males that we have to fight because you live in a society that has reduced you in power. You live in a society that has tried to neuter you at the socioeconomic level. The only thing that black males are allowed to do, and even then, even that is regulated and controlled, by the way. But the the area of our lives that seemingly has the least obstacles is sexual. So lo and behold, you have a bunch of black males out here who haven't really, you know, excelled in anything else. So they're just running around laying up with anything. And that is their definition of power. Meanwhile, he is failing at literally everything in life. His son, who carries his legacy, because do you carry his last name? Yes. So are you his oldest son? No, I'm a mom's oldest. Okay, you're the oldest of his marriage with your mother. Yes, sir. Okay, so you are the oldest legitimate child, is what you're saying. Yes, sir. Yep. All right, I want you all to understand something right here because you have had, understand something. Black boys who grow up with slutty mamas, they talk like that dude from New Jersey. That guy who called up earlier from New Jersey, he was raised by a slutty ass mama who told him that all women are queens and it doesn't matter what they do and that men owe them something. So I want you to understand, I want to give you a very brief lesson about something so you all can be reminded why the term bastard exists. So listen carefully, everybody listening here now. Time to remind you why the term bastard exists. Because a man has an intrinsic right to choose who carries his legacy. And it may be necessary for that man to reject one female for whatever reason. She's gone bad. She no longer carries his principles, whatever the case may be. He might have to revoke her rights to carry his name. So legitimacy is essential because that is the man's way of saying this child, this one, not them over there. This one is the reincarnation of me. This one is the one that I trust with my legacy, with my name. Everything that I have built and done, this is the one I have touched and blessed and imbued with that. Not them them little bastards over here. This is the one that the legacy that was handed to me. This is the one that was handed to that I'm going to hand down to. This is the one I'm handing it down to. So that we have continuity of the bloodline. Continuity of the history and the legacy. That it has already been determined that you are the one who's been entrusted to carry all of this. That he's putting that in your hands and that he is publicly stating, 
I am maintaining the continuity of the bloodline. You all don't have to look all over the damn place. I'm publicly saying that this woman and the child that she carries, this is where the history of my bloodline continues. Not them kids kids over there. There have been wars fought over who was the legitimate heir to a legacy. There are wars, there are lawsuits, there are murders that continue to this day, by the way, about who is the legitimate heir to a legacy. Legacy is just that powerful. When I told you all here tonight, a man does not respect weakness. A man demands respect. That, that's because of bloodline. You're, you're supposed to be proud to carry that name. You are supposed to see, you're supposed to see yourself as privileged and, 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 and lucky, fortunate to carry that name. That of all the boys in the world, you carry this man's name. And there is nothing more lowly and disrespectful and, 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 and despicable than to be a man, a male, who your sons, the masculine reincarnation of you, does not respect your name. Need I remind you all of what Kirk Franklin's son just did to him? If you want to know what genuine disrespect, what genuine contempt feels like. Take a look at what Kirk Franklin's son did to him. Think about that for just a few moments. Think about that level of base betrayal. How the, the amount of overwhelming hostility and, 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 and loathing that that boy, 33 years old, must have for his father. That Kirk Franklin... You don't have to like his music or whatever, but do you know what it's like to be a black man in this country and be able to accomplish that? Yes, I got issues about him professionally and maybe some socially, but I'm just talking about at, 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 at you know, surface level here. Just a surface level. This boy is sitting up here being financed by his daddy and take a look at the level of disrespect he has there. Now imagine being the father in that situation. Your legacy and your bloodline matter. And you are your father's legacy. And I just think he needs to know before he leaves this world how ashamed of him you are. Because you're calling me because that fella failed at the most basic responsibility of manhood to teach your son to respect the family name. He's failed at the very most basic level. And what I mean is that he has failed to teach you this through his example. It is very clear that you don't have respect for him at a basic level because, I mean, and I'm not saying that you have rancor or, or hostility. My problem is that I can hear you on this phone. You don't have much of anything. Your father has lived. I'm assuming he's still alive and he will die. And it didn't really matter. That is the most damning commentary that a child can give their parent. You lived, you died, and you didn't matter. I don't care that you were here. You weren't consequential. I will not talk to the grandchildren about your exploits. I will not make them proud to carry your name. I don't have any I don't have anything bad to say about you. I just don't have anything good to say about you. Imagine living your whole life and your children tell you, I don't really have anything good to say about you. I mean, I don't have anything bad or good. You're just kind of, I'm just kind of indifferent about you. Uh, you really just don't matter. That is the definition of walking dead. Did you say you were 26? Yes, sir. I'm old enough to be your father. 
Now, I want you to understand that as we get older as men, this list I gave you up here when I said demands respect, understand something. When you get to a point where you can't lay up with the females like you used to or whatnot, either because you're too successful and got too much going on or health issues or whatever, you know, you, you get to a point where you, you stop running them streets like the young guys did and whatnot. And now you're supposed to sit back and enjoy the fruits of your labor and the respect that you have earned over the last two plus decades of your life. You're not supposed to be still out here working, fighting together. You're supposed to have it. It's supposed to be secure. And your father doesn't have that. And that's a pathetic commentary on his life. Pathetic. So back to your question, how do you develop that type of masculine confidence? I am going to make to you one suggestion. And I pretty much already think I know but I'm going to ask you anywhere. Anyway, you're 26 years old. You are from, uh, did you say from Pennsylvania? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I was raised in Philly. How many places have you been outside of Philadelphia in your adult life, which is the last eight years, on your own? Um... Probably like three. Okay, which three places? I mean, I mentioned Minnesota, um, Maryland, and New York. Okay. Why did you go to Minnesota? Where at Minnesota did you go? Um, I went to Minnesota, um, what's it called? Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. And I went there right after high school. Why? Um, I just wanted to like experience something out of Philly. Okay. How did so you, I, I you say you said right out of high school, who did you go to stay with when you went there? My mom's friend. Your mom's friend. That doesn't sound very good. Yeah. Mom's friend. Who was he? Oh, no, it was a woman. Oh. Uh, they, they call him my aunt, but they call him best friends. Okay. Hmm. You might not want to dig too deep into that one. I'll just leave that there. Brooklyn Park. I think Jesse Ventura was the mayor of Brooklyn Park at one time. I may be wrong about that, but I think he was. At least he said he was. Um, when you in Maryland, where did you go? I went to. Um, I was in Hanover, Maryland. Okay, why did you go there? Um, IT workshop. Um, I started IT class, so. I your phone cut out on you. I hope we didn't lose you. No, I went for the um, IT workshop. Um, after I listened to your IT broadcast, um, I signed up for my IT security plus. All right. So I went there. To and uh, you said you went to New York. Why? How long ago did you go there and why did you go? I went to New York like three years ago and I've been back and forth. Um, I met my, my now wife there. Okay, well, now you have a wife. Well, that's good for you. I'm, I hope things are going well for you all. Yes. Okay, well, now he wants to get serious about that. But you are uncertain or insecure about your masculinity now. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Let me tell you why you are uncertain and un insecure about it. You are uncertain and insecure about it because you are afraid and because you have not proven to yourself that you can overcome risks. And until you do that, you will always be insecure. Always. Okay. You are probably the first person that I have ever met that I'm going to say this to, at least in my program, but I'm going to tell you right now, I think you may need to put those other things on hold. Because if you don't get in touch with yourself as a man, then what exactly did your wife marry? She might have married a nice guy, but just understand that women don't have respect for nice guys. Women have respect for leaders. And a leader who is not confident in himself is not a leader. Have you ever had any, have you taken any firearms training? No. Okay. Do you work out? Yes, I just started working out. Okay, again. you just started. So, in other words, you actually don't. So, you just started. No, I don't. At 26. Yeah. How, how much do you weigh? 
210. How tall are you? 5'9". Okay, then you can afford to lose about 25 pounds or so. So you can afford to do yeah. that. It's very hard to feel masculine and confident when you look in the mirror and don't see masculine or confident. Very hard to do that. How much do you know about your history as a black man? Um, honestly, I got into my history around 2013. Okay. When Trayvon Martin got murdered, I think. Okay. So, so. and nice, that's nice yeah. and everything, but that doesn't tell me what you, what did you study? What did I study? Yes. I honestly, I haven't studied much like okay. as far as books wise. All right. Well, into that. Of course, you should study the basics, the autobiography of Malcolm X, philosophies and opinions of Doc, of Marcus Garvey, anything and everything by Dr. John Henry Clark, Chancellor Williams, Joseph Ben uh Dr. Claude Anderson. You need to become a scholar of all those things because that is your legacy. That is what you're working for. That's what you're fighting for. That's what you're dealing with here. And of course, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. Uh, I think it's essential that you read the ISIS papers. Every black person should read the ISIS papers. And of course, throw Brother Neely Fuller in there as well. But you can't defend no. something that you don't understand. And your parents didn't give it to you. And your learning and your education is incomplete. So when you're going to the gym, it's one thing to hear about Trayvon Martin, but if you don't understand the context of America in its full complexity, and I can't give that to you in two minutes, you're going to have to do the work of actually digging into this and learn where you are. So when you understand it in its totality, in its proper context, then every time you pick up those weights and those plates, you know what you're getting stronger for. When you go to train with firearms, you know what you are putting your life on the line for and learning to kill for. It's not your wife. It is everyone who's come before you and the children and everyone who will come after you. But you can't personalize something you don't understand. Last but not least, you need to go see some things. You haven't seen anything. You haven't been anywhere. You haven't seen nothing. You haven't experienced anything. You need to go see some things. And you haven't done that. So you really need to take an opportunity to do that. Yeah, okay. But that is where those things change. You need to have some personal development in and of yourself. So first and foremost, yes, you're going to the gym. You need to be going seven days a week. And I meant what I said. You need to be going seven days a week. Damn anybody telling you about overtraining. You need to go seven days a week. To commune with yourself and to start having a standard with yourself. And you're going to have more mornings, which would be most mornings, where you don't want to even drag yourself out of bed to go do it. Get yourself up and go do it simply because that's your discipline. You need obstacles to overcome. You need sacrifices to make. You need things that you are willing to kill and die for. That is where masculinity and courage comes from. Finding something that is more important to you than yourself. By the way, how old is your wife? She's 23. Okay. What does she do for a living? Um... Yeah, she she just kind of started her own business, you know. Doesn't okay. work. Is that her right whispering now. to you now? <laughs> yes, it is. Okay, tell her I said hi. <laughs> hi, Jason. Okay, let me ask you something, ma'am. The things I just said a few moments ago that a women don't respect nice guys was I lying when I said that? <clears throat> no, you definitely weren't. Okay, I want him to listen to you, by the way. I want him to listen to that because I want him to understand that this is his first, last, and only warning. She is 23 years old. She is giving you her prime years of her life. Ma'am, I just got to ask you one question. What size do you wear? I'm a size 8. Okay, she is a size 8. Well, I won't go too far into that, but I will say... <laughs> 
<laughs> she's giving you her pro- she is giving you her peak years right now, my dude. She is giving you her peak years. You are either going to make a lifelong wife of her or you're going to make a lifelong enemy of her. I want you to understand that. She is giving you the most valuable years of her life right now. Do you have any children, ma'am? No, no children. Okay. She's 23 years old. She's a size eight. She has no children. I'm assuming size eight at more than five foot five or six. Please tell me that. Yeah, I'm five seven. Okay. Well, she just clearing the lot, but in size eight, you kind of tip in there now. Cause if we start edging towards 10 Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> We're both in the gym. Okay. Well, I want him to understand something, though, because as a man, he has to build muscle. As a female, you just got to keep the fat off. So the standard for him and the requirements for him will always be higher and more than for you. But I want him to understand how you see these years and how you will see them as you get older. Right now, she's not established. Right now, she's still working on establishing herself, but that's going to happen very quickly because this society makes it far easier for black females than they do for black males. Mm. I want you to understand that. Makes it far easier for that. And as such, she's going to make some progress very quickly. She's going to make progress very quickly. And once that begins to happen, the way that she sees you and the way that she approaches you is going to change. Now, you don't know that yet. You don't know that yet. You're, you don't understand that yet, but I think he's starting starting to dawn on him. And that's the situation. I'm just saying it to you here now because you're one of the first guys she met. But you're not going to be the last. She is going to meet others. And as a female, she is constantly going to be looking to get a better offer if one is available. Which means that that masculine competitiveness, you are not going to be allowed to sit here and just ignore that. That's not going to be something that's going to be optional. You are going to have to keep competitive because her life is going to keep changing. And she's going to, she already knows what I'm telling you right now. She's just a lot nicer to you about it. But she already knows what I'm telling you right now. That she gets approached by dudes. If she's got a Facebook or something, she gets DMs. But she's chosen you. That's great. That's cool. But there isn't some bank of masculine you know uh, there isn't some bank of credit that you're putting in equity and that your failure to perform is gonna keep her satisfied while you get things together that's not gonna happen or hey baby we was we was cool when you was 22 and 23 years old so that should carry me when you 28 and 29 and it's not the way it will work at all and worst of all if she finds somebody that she thinks is excelling in these areas where you're deficient she is going to exercise her options. And that is the way that life works. So you are very right to be concerned about these things. Now, I would advise her of one thing. Young lady, I don't know what your name is. I don't know where you're from. I don't know your upbringing. Well, I'm going to give you one cautionary tale right now. In this world, if you got a man who fools with you for real, you damn lucky. If you have a man who is willing to put his life on the line, sacrifice for you, work for you, change for you, if you have somebody who is willing to do that, the levels of masculinity that I was talking about here tonight, if you got a man who's willing to do that for you, you are damn lucky. (coughs) Forget hairstyles, forget shoes. You want a man who is going to be a workhorse for you. You want a man who's going to climb mountains, who is going to go to school, who is going to put it all on the line for you. That is what you want. And what ha- we go out here chasing dudes with swag and flash and this, that, and the other. Those guys don't produce. You need to f- make sure that when you found a producer and you've identified him, you lock him down. It sounds like you may have done that. Dude's trying to get himself together. And please understand, for men, we really don't even hit our peak until we get in our 30s. It really doesn't start to come together for us until we get there. 
So we don't even start to hit that until our mid 30s. So he's still got another eight, nine years. Now, you should be able to see the footsteps now in place. You should be able to see where he's putting it together. So he's trying to get his IT thing together, which means he's already eyeing that he wants to be a part of the top 5%. Well, that's what you want to do. You want to grab a hot prospect before he gets on and find somebody else. Because if you do happen to become a size 10, he's always going to, a man never forgets how he met you. He met you as a size eight. So you'll have a little leeway in there, but I wouldn't push it to a 12. You'll have a little leeway. I mean, there's going to be a little flexibility, but I'm just saying that flexibility will come because he fooled with you when he met you young as a size eight. So as long as you don't go to 16, you might be okay. But my real point is if you can lock him down, if he's, if he's a producer and he remembers that you were there in the lean years, he's never going to go anywhere. And if he desires to produce for you, he always will. The biggest mistake that females make today is they go out trying to do sexual thrill seeking and sexual thrill rides. And they go off and get bastard babies, STDs, outrageous body counts. They're unable to to actually, you know, bond to a man because they've had so many men laying on top of them that sex doesn't mean anything. And that's how women destroy themselves. So if this guy fools with you for real, my biggest piece of advice to you is I don't know what your parents were like. I don't know what your father was like. But if you have someone who fools with you for real, hold the on to them. Especially if he's getting up every day trying to figure out how he can be a better man and a better person. Do you know how damn hard that is to find today? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I I hope both of y'all keep your uh, keep your uh, your uh, your um, memberships at Bally or Planet Fitness or wherever y'all going. I hope you keep that together. I want both of y'all to uh, advance at that. Um, so brother, what I am going to tell you is those are the things I would advise you to do there. I would advise you to do that because that's where you need to go. And by the way, she needs to do the same thing because if you two are going to be married, if this is going to be the mother of your children, you need to be able to trust her that she is going to raise children in your image. And she can't do that yes, what she doesn't know. So if she doesn't know Dr. John Clary Clark, Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, if she doesn't know our history, how is she going to teach your children? Right. So that's the other thing. Now I will it, I will allow you to go to divorce court if you made the wrong decision on that. Now if she doesn't know and she doesn't want to learn, and eh, you gotta go. Yeah, got it'd be better to divorce her now before you get your money together so she can't get nothing, as opposed to waiting four or five years and then you you're shackled to that. So yeah, y'all need to sit down and have a talk about that. Well then forget that because he might not do it right. Uh young lady, uh, what do you know about our people's history? Um, so surprisingly he, um, I'm not sure if I wasn't here for the whole call, so I really don't know what he spoke about with you, but, um, he's the one that actually put me on to a lot of different things. Um, a lot of things that we're told in the media are pretty much false. And, um, I don't think he's done a really good job at expressing how much he actually does know just cause we both listen to you and we know you put people in line real quick. So I guess he kind of didn't really get into those details. So he has definitely um, recommended a bunch of different books to me, um, different podcasts to listen to. I don't know any off the top of my head right now, but we're definitely still both in that learning stage, still both trying to – we're both African. Um, I'm not sure if he said that. My my parents, both of our parents are immigrants, and so a lot of misconceptions have been taught to us throughout um, our youth, and a lot of confusing things have been kind of drilled into us. So that's the stage that we're in right now trying to just really figure out um where we stand in the world as you know africans but as african americans okay where where are your people from so um my parents are from the ivory coast so that's uh, west africa all right and where are his people from liberia okay now i want to give you a i want to thank you very much for being respectful here tonight because that's very good that's very very Mm -hmm. good in the future, I expect him to do most of the talking. The first place you can lead is with your mouth. So in the future, I just want him to be aware. Thank you for being respectful tonight. In the future, I expect you to do most of the talking. Um, ma'am, uh, I certainly, I'm certainly glad you've been paying attention. And those are all very, very good because I would, but you're going to have to become masterful about this in your own right. So it's very good. You got your training wheels on right now and it'll take you a little bit of time, but just understand this is not a, a hobby. This is a way of life. And we will be expect. We are expecting you to teach the children 
So you can't teach them what you don't know or what you don't have respect and reverence for. So Mm -hmm. we cannot do that. We cannot do that. So just keep that in mind. By the way, does this young lady have a job? (laughs) Yes. Okay. I want, um, do you have a degree? Yes. Oh, hell. Now, she has a degree. (laughs) How about you, Nasheed? No, I don't. Okay. Do, Do you see a potential problem there, sir? Yes. Okay. Let me say this to you in no uncertain terms, and I'm not trying to make trouble. Just understand, in the current social environment that we are in, she will have a lot of pressure on her because I've met a lot of Nigerian hood rats this year, by the way. Hood rats from Nigeria. Yes, I'm serious. A lot of hood rats from the continent. They're they, they messing up over there big time. But I just want you to understand there's going to be a lot of pressure on her to sit up here and do foolishness. So just under with, right. with folk trying to tell her that she's a mismatch. By the way, there's one thing. What is her degree in? Media communication. Okay. Nasheed should know what that is. Nasheed, did you know what her degree was in? Um, yeah, media communications. Okay, you didn't say nothing. I was asking you. So that's not a good look. When did she graduate yeah, from it's not really a, when did she graduate uh, from uh, when did she graduate from school, Nasheed? Twenty nineteen. Okay. Because remember something, you're supposed to be two steps ahead of everything. Media communications, quite simply, that's a useless degree, by the way. You're not going to be doing anything with that. (laughs) Uh, Well, she's figuring out now. She's figuring out now. Here's the problem. The problem is, you know how black women operate. If one degree doesn't serve them, they go back and get another one. So she's she's probably, let me guess, she's probably already gearing up to go back to school now. Um, she was trying to get her master's degree. I kind of talked her out of it. Oh, well, good. Okay. At least you stopped her from doing something super silly. So yeah, that, that's, <laughs> that's not, yeah, that would just be silly, ma'am. That would just be outrageously silly. You're doubling down on something that wasn't working before. Well, the bachelor, my bachelor's degree didn't do me nothing. Maybe I should get a master's. Okay. You couldn't do nothing with the bachelor's. What's the master's going to do for you? Except triple your debt. Right. So, no, in reality, that was not going to do a great thing for you there. I would suggest that if you're going to work, you need to do something different, okay? You, you need to do something that you can actually use. If it's not STEM or, in your case, uh, maybe nursing, if you're going to go to school for something, you really need to have something that's going to uh, help you. Well, I didn't, express, I didn't see myself in that. You cannot choose the job market. You have to deal with it yourself. If you want to go into real estate you know, and become a realtor, that might be something you want to look at as well. But drop the communications thing. You're not, that that degree is going to do nothing. Don't go for psychology, sociology, liberal arts, any of that crap. Um, you need to go straight for a field, not for a degree. Your parents misinformed you, which most kids' parents today misinformed them greatly. You don't need another degree. You need an actual skill. If you want more, and as a matter of fact, I will do you two a solid. If you two would like to contact me personally, I would be willing to have a one-on-one conversation with you free of charge. No nonsense there. I would be willing to talk to you later because I've I've got other callers on the line right now. But if you want me to follow up with you further, I would be willing to avail you to that. Are you members of my patron? No. Okay. Well, what I'll allow you to do there, if you want to, that'll be up to you. The only reason why I'll do this is because I do think that people should put skin in the game for that. If you're not members of my patron, you may want to sign up for that. I will not necessarily require it. It just makes it easier because when people email me, I may or may not be able to get back to them. But if you would like for me to, you can email me. You know, if you're going to do that, you better do it tonight. At um, Okay. You better do it tonight at handlethebusiness at yahoo.com. And um, if you want me to talk to you further about that, I can go a bit more in depth about that. All right. I, I, we're going to do that tonight, man. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for giving us a call tonight. Um, you're on the right track. But remember, even if you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. So don't let the grass grow under your feet. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank, thank you very you. much for giving us a call tonight. They got other things that we need to talk to them about. We need to talk about your credit. We need to talk about your savings. We need to talk about your aspirations. So there's a number of different things that need to be taken care of here that I can't, you know, just do uh, during one phone call tonight. But catch them early. Catch them early. Catch them early. Invest. 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 Catch them early. 
Let me get caller from area code 469. You're on live with the business. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Oh, this is Big Stone from Dallas, Texas. I'm Big Stone from Dallas. I'm calling you, calling you tonight. I'm uh, calling you tonight, Jason Black, to let you know, man, I'm a chess player, and it's full of guys that play chess. And I'm going to make three points out of this. One of the guys, all all these guys are kind of very masculine men. And one of the guys, he done saved an old man's life. He done saved a young man's life. He he, he just keeps the peace. He's a leader. Old man, he's a Muslim. He's making fun of a couple of dykes. The dyke came unglued and was finna just, you know, just beat the hell out of this old man. The guy, he stepped in, uh, took charge, you know, kind of broke it up, settled everything, got old, calmed the, oh, uh, the, uh, the dyke down, the uh, homosexual woman down, and, and kept the peace. It was another young man. He had got some bad drugs. Okay. And he was uh, – Well, uh, definitely it, it, so- it, it sounds like we got some tales from the hood going on out there, but I'm glad to see they're handling their business. <laughs> okay, uh- Thank you very much for giving us a call tonight. Let me get call it from area code three oh five. You're on live with the business. What's your name? Where are you calling from? TBA, what they do? It's your boy One Love three oh five out of Miami. One love out of Miami. What's on your mind, brother? Hey man, you, you dropping flames like a ignited gas can tonight. Um I never thought I had even do this, but I got to call out something. Your mods, one of your mods is going ham tonight. And with your, with your, the subject matter that you're talking about, I think she's disrespecting on what you're saying. It's counterproductive. Okay. I won't say well, who she is, but well, you don't know who she's not. Well, let me, let me be clear about this. My mods do what I tell them to do. So okay, no, if no you, disrespect. If you have an issue no with some, my mods contact me privately. So I will just tell anybody if they have an issue with something they see my mods do, I would first inform you my mods don't do anything that I'm not telling them to do. So they're following my instructions. And I do monitor my chat room and I do let them know if I see something that they should not do. So maybe we have a misunderstanding. Okay, can I can I expound and let you let you know what I'm what I'm speaking of? Well, I'm really trying to stick to a specific subject here tonight, and, and, and I'm, I'm on that topic. Okay, tonight, Mr. so Mr. if Mr. you Black, if you yeah. have if you have something that you would like to say on the subject tonight, not related to absolutely my, not related to my mods, <laughs> I'll discuss my mods some other time if I feel like I need to. Yes, sir. Absolutely. I respect you. I respect the way you're handling that. I, I, I absolutely was in, in total agreement. There is no such thing as uh, uh, toxic masculinity. Now, I almost lost what I was going to say because of uh, the, the, the new Rainbow Coalition from New Jersey, what he threw out there. But I, my comment was that a father, not a black father, but a father never chooses when to become a father. My example was outside of what, what the mod highlighted me on was that if there's a young person, a young man who looks at an older man who says, I look up to you, you know, for what you're doing, they see how you move in the streets. I don't get to choose, you know, that young man to look up to me. He looked up to me. On the other hand, uh, Jason, is when a mother chooses to be a mother. If I wanted to be a father my whole life, that mother could say, I don't like what he said last night and go to the clinic. But once I shoot mine out, it's out there. She can abort the baby and she can not abort the baby. She can poke holes in the condom. But I don't get to choose. I have no, no choice in the matter. I was in the yard with my sons today, and I told you I let my sons listen to the show at seven and five years old. We always listen to your program. My son was picking up cones, pine cones in the yard, had his back turned 
to holes. I told them, watch out for the holes. Could be snakes in there. You don't know what it is. The mom would say, well, as long as he's picking up the cones. But I don't get to choose to not be a father and direct my son at that time to the detriment of my son and, and allow him to be hurt. Um, so I'm trying not to bring up the mods, you know, th that person. Like I said, you'll know who is not. Well, I'm, 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 I have a feeling that you're not. I have a feeling you might be mistaken. That might not have been a moderator. I have a feeling that might not have been. I could be wrong, but um, based on what I'm hearing, I'm having a feeling that might not have been the case. But definitely get your point here, brother. And uh, thank you very much for giving us a call here tonight. Let me get call from area code eight six two. You're on live with the business. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Yeah, my name's Victor from North New Jersey. Victor, not from that widow nigga. Okay, oh, I was about to say here because he apparently in his world masculinity is toxic, and I'm like, okay, dude, if you hit ninety five with a turnpike talking like that, good luck to you. What's on your mind, brother? <laughs> nah, I you know I I heard him. You know, I just got off of work, and I'm like, oh, my God, yo, you are freaking a clown. Like, what do you mean you don't? The problem is black men have to compete. Uh, spoiler alert, everybody competes, bro. Welcome to the world. How do you eat? Well, he How told, do you eat out here? Remember, he, he sat there and literally said that women can do everything we can do and that masculinity and femininity are social constructs. They're not physical facts. Yeah. They're just things that we made up as a as a practice in society. That's literally what he said. Yeah. I, somebody asked him how many women you can get to move a sectional. Huh? How many women you can get to move your entire living room set? What about your china cabinet? That's simple stuff. That's light work. That's light work. Straight clown. Like, you know, I ain't going to hold you. I ain't going to be on here long. It's just that he made me so mad, yo. I really had to call him. Like, that's not how it goes down out here. Well, definitely. I mean, we can go beyond that, though. I mean, who is going to risk their lives? Who are going to be the firefighters when, when a car needs to have the jaws of life used on it? Who's going to brave the flames and go do that? Who is going to go off here and, and, and go tow the trucks and whatnot? Who's going to do that? That's what men do. It's not because they don't hire women for that. Women don't sign up to be tow truck drivers. Women don't sign up to be firefighters. Women don't sign up to be high-rise construction construction workers women don't sign up for that they don't you might find one and even still she's got to have help carrying the tanks no women have every opportunity exactly. to do that these are things that men do women will tell you i wouldn't want to work high-rise construction that mess is dangerous and you're damn right it is <laughs> i've worked high-rise construction you're damn right it's dangerous it's dangerous work it's exhilarating for guys we get used to it and it's fun but that's not something that they want to do so we can go beyond just you know manual labor it is the type of work the risk involved the amount of uh hands on that is required is it dirty work you know there's a reason why women don't like to be auto mechanics yep. you know as little boys we're taught to get in the mud the females are like hey i'm not going i could chip a nail trying to change that oil filter much less you know a, a brake yeah. caliber i'm not going to do that there so these are differences and that's okay by the way these are differences in skills that are outgrowths of our personalities and of our beings but for someone to tell the vicious evil greasy dripping lie that there is no difference between men and women and that women and men the women can do the same things that men can do that's not just being inaccurate that is being a filthy liar and not only being a liar yeah. you are dangerous you are Telling women the falsehood that if somebody breaks in the house, because what he really wants to get to is to say if somebody breaks in the house, he has the ability to tell her to go down. Now, why would he want to do that? And you and I both understand where that really comes from. He wants to be able to tell when he talked about how females can be toxic. He really was going to get to 50 50. Now, that's where he was going with it was if a oh, female, yeah. if a man shouldn't have to lead financially, a female can do half the work and can do half the spending and take care of the household. As a matter of fact, here's the problem with 50-50. If a woman can do 50-50, she can do 100%. 
That's the problem. <laughs> those are facts, Jason. I mean, those are facts. But the fact of the matter is, you sound like the sort of dude that goes Dutch. Oh, no. Oh, we're going to split the bill. Oh, no, 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 no. He'll, he'll talk about split splitting the, the bill. bill. That Good sounds, job, buddy. No, that sounds like the type of nigga that you sit up here and find sitting on the couch at his girlfriend's house. For, forget forget just sitting up here splitting the bill. This is the kind of guy who's sitting at home and saying, why can't I be a stay-at-home dad? And you can tell he's a beta male because you listen to the words he says. He's like, feel. Think, believe. No, these are facts. These are facts. They're very simple. It's two plus two. You can't wish it to be six. It is what it is. Like, don't don't get out here talking about, oh, well, you know, you know, this toxic. There's no such thing as toxic masculinity. It's men or non-men. End of the very story. End of the story. Thank you very much for giving us a call here tonight. I want to go ahead and give you all a brief reminder here about why I said what I said earlier here. Let's be very, very clear about things. There is a reason that a man must always, must always, must. Am I hitting this damn microphone enough? Must always strive to be his woman's financial leader. Because if you are not a woman's financial leader, you will find it very difficult to be her social leader. And I'm not saying that it can't be done, but it will be difficult because she will always, she has the capacity to challenge your authority. And if she has the capacity, you're just getting up every day hoping it doesn't happen. That's the first thing. But secondly, the reason why you must always, must always strive to be your woman's financial leader is because leadership isn't something that you split the bill on. Now, little old moist dudes like the guy from New Jersey who called over an hour ago, he love he will love sitting up here telling you that women can do everything a man can do right up until the woman pulls his whole card. Right up until the woman sits up here and and, and starts telling him about the way that things need to be. Then all of a sudden, he's going to demand that things need to be different. Right when she starts emasculating him and when when 50-50 turns into her giving him instructions, or as I've told you all before, all these weak guys like love talking about 50-50 right up until the female wants to decide which 50% she should be in charge of. Then all of a sudden you want to sit up and object. There's only one way to prevent that. It needs to be clear from day one that this is not 50-50. This is my ship. This is my boat. And if I so deem it, I will bless you with the privilege, not the right, the privilege to maybe get the opportunity to join my crew. But let's be very, very clear. This is the SS Jason Black that you are getting on. This is not the SS partnership. This isn't a partnership. This is a leadership. And I'm the leader. But you cannot do that when your situation is constantly compromised. As a man, you must always strive for financial leadership. Because at the end of the day, you are going to want to decide which way things go. You are not going to be okay with your woman telling you, here's what it's going to be. Now, maybe that guy actually might be. Who knows? When they get infantilized bad enough. But as soon as a woman wants to sit up here and pull a rank on you, then all of a sudden you're going to want to tell her you can't do that. Everybody loves sharing power with their woman right up until their woman tells them what you going to do. Then he doesn't want to share power anymore. Now he doesn't like it. Now he's looking like Columbus Short, which is stuff getting put out. Now you don't like power sharing right after you sat here preaching its virtues for all this time. As men, we don't operate that way. Masculinity does not share power. Masculinity does not share direction. We already got the direction. Masculinity doesn't look for a woman to give him purpose. He already got a purpose masculinity doesn't look for protection i i provide the protection it doesn't look for 50 50 it's already got 100 percent. that's how you prevent dis- disputing situations you prevent disputes by bringing a hundred percent already 
that she cannot bring anything to you that you cannot already do yourself. So you have the option of letting her go. Now, you know what she doesn't have? She doesn't have the muscular strength to change her tires. She doesn't have the muscular strength to move the couch on her own. She doesn't have the desire to get up under the car and change the oil. She doesn't have the ability to lift the tree in the backyard if it falls. That's what she needs you for. Oh yeah, and if somebody breaks into the house, she doesn't have the ability to stop him from making it up the stairs. And it, on average, it takes police approximately six minutes to respond to an emergency phone call. So do you realize what that really means? That means for over five and a half minutes, it's just you and the assailant. Understand that. In case any of you were under any illusions about that. Takes the police about five to six minutes to show up for an emergency phone call. So that means that from the moment that things go wrong, even if you could instantaneously contact the police, and assuming they show up and don't be lazy about it, for the next five to six minutes, it's just you and the bad guy and whatever he can get away with doing. And every woman intrinsically understands the peril that she's in in that situation. You can't contact a social worker. Oprah Winfrey isn't there to narrate. MSNBC and Rachel Maddow can't sit there and put on the hair shirt and scream about how wrong it is. Welcome to real damn life. It's just you and the bad guy. And whatever's about to happen next. Still don't think you need... Some toxic masculinity in your life? Caller from Erico 352. You're on live with the business. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Okay, caller from 352 has been abducted. We got a bunch of phone calls on the line right now. I got about 20, 30 calls sitting up here right now. So, folks, we're not going to be able to sit up here and dance with anybody who's not ready to talk. Let me get caller from Erico 678. You're on live with the business. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Me running from Stone Mountain. Okay, brother, I don't know what you're doing on the phone. It sounds like you're starting a beatbox career. If you're in front of a fan or something, I'm going to give you two seconds to stop. Talk. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you when you're not going to have that the wind blowing over your phone. breaking up. No, it's not breaking up, sir. It's Nearing like from Stone Mountain, Georgia. How okay. are you doing this evening? Nearing from Stone Mountain, what's on your mind? Um, I had a question. Um, well, you're saying it's not toxic masculinity but there is something out here that is toxic and i guess it's i got I, I i don't know what to coin it i guess it would be um toxic machismo or just ignorant where you have people out here who are not like yourself or who can articulate how to handle you know the aggression in in a way but they just use you know the answer to everything is they want to shoot the fade or they want to you know um, you know, they call it standing up or keeping it real. But as we know, as uh, Dave Chappelle had 90 real seconds. Wrong, <laughs> most of the times when you're not doing it the right way, where it will, when you are keeping it real, it's, you're keeping it real to your detriment where, you know, there'll be you going to jail, you getting fired, you getting shot, you getting buck broken because of you trying to so-called have what, people will consider masculinity. So that's the question, what I want to know. I mean, me personally, you know, I've grown up. Okay, well, my father, we, we, really, we really can't Sorry. discuss you personally, but I would like to go back to something you okay. just said there. So you're saying that it can be toxic machismo. Can you please tell me and explain specifically? Don't be vague because you brought this up. So if you brought it up, you should be able to explain it clearly. And if you can't, that kind of explains a lot. Can you explain to me specifically what is the macho part of being butt broken? There is no part, part of being butt broken. Okay. That's the consequence. Okay, but, okay, of, but, okay, you know, yeah, sir. All right. That was what, the, okay, um, but that situation. was, but that was what you said. You were the one who named the rat named off. You rattled off a list of different things, going to jail, getting shot, getting butt broken. 10 seconds. You were the one who rattled off that list. 
as being keeping it yeah. real as being keeping it real going wrong. You were the one who said that list. Yeah. So I'm trying to find yeah. out on the the guys who are mistaken about their toxic machismo because they think it's keeping it real, but yeah, but it's keeping it real going wrong, and they can end up shot in jail, getting buck broken. So okay, you gave the example. Now you're saying, oh, that's not what it is. So maybe you need a chance to just really get your thoughts together and and decide exactly what you mean because you're kind of contradicting yourself now. No, I was asking the question: if it's not toxic masculinity. Is, is it toxic machismo? Is it just ignorance? Okay, you know, there's what? a lot of people okay, in the street who will again. tell you let's, know these young okay, Nira, guys. Let's try this that again. If they're not keeping okay, it real. Okay, we're not going to talk over the host. You hear me just fine. Let's try this one yeah, last time. What? Give me a specific example of what it is that you would consider to be quote toxic machismo. Where we'll just say in any given situation, oh, okay, I'll give you a prime example, all right? Because this happened to me in okay, life. Okay, okay, give us an Growing example. Give street. us, no, no, give us an example in seven, I just need a specific type, seven seconds or less. Give me an example of what you mean. Okay. You're in a situation where logically, you, uh, it's a it's a it's a messed up um fight and and it's on a lie, but instead of saying okay this is just a misunderstanding you know we'll just you know let's just cut bait let bygones be bygones you'll have the person who's saying I'm from the streets I want respect you know I'm not gonna let you you know do me like this and then it just becomes a pissing contest because both of the people are not willing to back down as uh the boondocks would say a nigga moment. Okay, well, in that type of situation there, it it, it would really just depend because I'm just going to be totally honest with you here. We only hear those kind of negative comments. We only hear that characterized as a negative connotation among black people. If you all remember, there was a case in, I believe it was either Iowa or Idaho. There was, uh, what was he, an off-duty firefighter or something? He had been having a constant running dispute with his neighbor these were two white men and on video the one white man is riding a lawn mower riding mower and he brandishes a gun at his neighbor letting him know i got it on me and mr firefighter turns around walks two steps away and then spins around pulls out his gun and shoots the guy three times now the fella survived the shooting but you don't hear those kind of things being characterized as white folks you know doing their version of nigga stuff you don't hear that now, that, that never gets called that kind of way. Now, we can go down the list of contradictions that are out there and whatnot, but I'm going to be very, very clear about something right now. And I'm glad that this question actually came up because a lot of folks don't understand something. Let me be very, very clear with you. You have leadership when there's a clear understanding. And right now, the problem in black society is there is not a clear understanding of what the pecking order is. Now, among Irish people, Italians and whatnot, they had gangs, they had mobsters, they had the mafia. They established a pecking order. And if you attempted to defy the pecking order, there were consequences for doing so. Now, in Japanese society and whatnot, they got the Yakuza, whatever. They maintained the order amongst the people. And we don't have that. What you have are a bunch of renegade Negroes out here who want to define everything for themselves, and they are failing spectacularly. And the reason for that is because there are not swift and immediate consequences for going off code. So what you have just described to me is an attempt at gaining a clear understanding. And in my experience, Correct. there don't actually have to be a whole lot of things like that to happen. In reality, there's not a whole lot of situations like that that have to occur. So I would just be, I would, in my opinion, quite frankly, I actually can't necessarily tell you I would necessarily have a problem with that. I wouldn't necessarily see that as, quote, toxic. Because understand something one of those men might actually be the superior and the right one. 
He has no need whatsoever to give way to an idiot. He has no need whatsoever to give way to the weak. And he has no obligation to sit up here and let the dumbest guy in the room have his way. And we have been set up here and told that we need to prioritize quote unquote civility. And you know what civility got us? Civility got us Oprah politely sitting back while Oprah Winfrey rips us to shreds. Civility got us politely sitting back while they legalize marijuana over here and stone people out of their damn heads. Quote unquote, you want to hear about something toxic? How about toxic civility? How about that? How about this toxic waste dump where everybody is correct except for the civilized? We have we have set up here and told people that civility now is acceptable from everyone except the civilized. They are the only ones who are intolerable. The people who can read and write and count. There's something wrong with us. We don't need to be tolerated. And now it's gotten to the point that the dumbest people in the room are trying to flex on the smartest people. Because precisely what I said at the beginning of the program, there are no consequences for being dumb. There are no consequences for it. So if you start describing a situation that uh, requires consequences, I don't have a problem with that. Now, I would like to give you a more extreme example that you didn't think of. I would like to give you uh, the California prison system. In that system, if you look at somebody wrong, you can die. Believe it or not, there's not a lot of folk who die in it. And this is among nothing but criminals and hardened gang members. There are actually a relatively low number of incidents, considering the population you got there. Now, why do you think that is? That they, in that, in that environment where you're dealing with a bunch of criminalized individuals, and they've all the most of the overwhelming majority of them who have not been wrongly convicted are there because they've committed some type of serious offense. And yet when you put them all together in an environment where there's nothing separating any of them, but air and opportunity, there is a strict set of rules, not a set of rules made by the prison, a set of rules instituted and maintained by the, the men, by the inmates themselves. Now, you would consider that to be the most toxic, chaotic environment in the world. And in reality, it's not. It is very structured. It is very structured. Everybody knows where they stand. Everybody knows the rules. Everybody's got each other's backs. Everybody pulls their weight. You know why? Because there will be consequences if you don't. And everybody knows what the expectations are and nobody gets to sit there and give you their college dissertation about why they won't do it. If you don't do it, you're going to have to go in protective custody because they're going to get you up off the yard today. I suggest you don't go to chow hall. You probably aren't coming out. Now, According to your example, why that wouldn't be toxic machismo, that would be downright radioactive. I call it structure. And I'm not afraid of structure. I'm not worried about structure. I certainly probably wouldn't want to enjoy the structure of the California prison system. But at the same time, out here on the streets, and I've talked to many ex-convicts, and they all say the same thing. They, they can't stand the way that people out here on the street in, invade your private space, get too close to you, get friendly, shoot off at the mouth at you. They're like, I'm from a place behind bars. You can't do that. Respect is enforced. Yeah. I have friends like that. They say penitentiary rules apply. I, I got this. Okay, but, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Those aren't penitentiary rules. Those are manhood rules. Please remember the man who would have become uh, one of your early presidents of the United States, Alexander Hamilton. He got himself killed in a duel with Aaron Burr. Why? Running off at the mouth. And Mr. Burr was like, uh, sir, I demand satisfaction. You've been, you've been running off at the lip and I done caught up with you. So 
we can settle this one way or the other, but there's not going to be a bunch more running your mouth at me. Not going to be any more of that. You, you smarted off for the last time. And let me tell you, in a system and under rules like that, you don't have a lot of people who do that. That doesn't happen very often. In feudal Japan, when you were allowed to take it straight to people and whatnot, there were, there were actually far fewer incidents. In the day and age we live now, where people think that they've got laws that protect their, quote, freedom of speech, and now they've redefined it as freedom to disrespect, yeah, they go off and do that. But I actually prefer an environment where people make, where it's clear to people that there are clear boundaries. Because understand something, as black people, we have allowed people to speak against us. We have allowed, as black men in particular, I'm doing this program tonight because we've been cowed into toxic cowardice. We allow everybody to speak against us. The women, the children, non-black people. I put up a story today about a black woman in New York. She was arrested by, it must have been six or seven cops around her, brought her out in handcuffs because she was harassing Asians. And they called it a racist attack. What did she do? She didn't lay a hand on anybody. Simply yelling insults at Asians was called an attack. And of our apathy and our inaction. That we have made it where people can assault us and that's okay. We can't even say nothing about other people. They will actually take physical action. Take a look at the differences in how it's treated. And they're just doing this blatantly in front of our faces now. That, yeah, you can't even say nothing about Asians. Everybody else can. The same thing that she got arrested for, folk are doing to black folk every, non-black people are doing it to black folk every single day with no consequences. Because we have not demonstrated to them that whatever you want to call our masculinity, you're about to experience it. Whether you wish to or not. Now, when we start behaving in that manner, That we are not going to ask for respect. We will insist upon it. And you will adhere. Or whatever type of masculinity you think I've got. Whatever you want to call it. It's about to run all over your ass. It's been my experience. You have to usually have to do that once. Maybe twice. Never has to be done three times. They usually get the message. And we have become people who have become scared and coy about delivering messages. If you've got somebody's bastard baby son who was taught by some hood rat to sit up here and run his mouth. Let me tell you something, uh, Brother Niren. My folks taught me when I was young that I better watch what I say to people because you're liable to get your head slapped off. Now, you notice what they didn't say to me? They didn't teach me about freedom of speech. Well, of course, I understood the Bill of Rights in the Constitution. My parents did not teach me that you can say whatever you want to. Can't nobody say nothing to you. That's some hood rat hoe talk because she's depending upon men to come save her ass. She's depending on the system to save her ass from her own stupidity. She's depending on white folk to come save her. As a man, you don't have that. You're supposed to be wiser and smarter. And understand that there will be consequences immediately for what you do. But I was taught from an early age, you don't get to say whatever you want to say. You don't get to talk however you want to talk. You're a male. Your words carry more weight and more pertinence. I was never taught that I can just say to somebody whatever I want to say. And by the way... To anybody who wants to make any other comments and whatnot, I'm not like your other YouTubers, by the way. I don't screen calls. And for Meet the Director, I didn't require driver's licenses or anything else. If you paid the money, I gave you the location. You can come see me. It's really not that difficult. And if it was, if you think I'm scared about it, you better ask all the dozens of people who've come to Meet the Director. Ask them. If I needed security when I walked out from behind that door, you ask them if I did. Ask my interview subjects how much, quote, security I got to go around with. It's just me and the occasional stray candy bar. I've sat in Jared Taylor's house and I've told you all. And if you've never been to his house, I have. 
And he has a number of young strapping lads around there. And there was only a few black folk in that house, and I was one of them. Anything could have gone down. I'm sitting in the belly of the beast. I'm still here. Same thing with Richard Spencer. I went right there. There was a bunch of them sitting there and whatnot. And it's just me. It's just me. These other folk can't say that. By the way, it's just me. That's all. So I understand what it's like to deal with folk in that way. Anybody can run their damn mouth on the internet. Uh, let me see you go jump into a the headquarters of some white supremacists. And let me hear you run your mouth the way I did. Let me hear you say some of the things I did right there in front of them. Let me hear you say that. Easy for Roland Martin to sit in TV One studio and talk like that to Richard Spencer. Uh, he wouldn't have been talking like that if he had been sitting in that damn Hitler Youth convention that I was in. He wouldn't have done that. I was taught that you don't get to just say whatever you want to say. I was taught that from an early age. So when you tell me that it's toxic, that a fella can't run his mouth and say whatever he wants to say without considering the consequences of it, that's a foreign concept to me, Niren. I don't understand that. I don't see that. To say that's toxic, I guess the problem is I consider that to be a foreign concept because I was never trained to believe that I could do that. Ever. Ever. Didn't take a prison stint in California to teach me that either. So I guess I don't understand why you would think that's toxic. I was always, I guess I can only assume you were not, your folks didn't teach you that. Mine did. Mine taught me that if I said the wrong thing to the wrong person, if you're lucky, you'll get smacked up. If you're not, you'll die. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Really about- oh yeah. And one more thing that I left out. My folks also taught me, Jason, you might be the wrong person to smart off to. Uh, what were you going to say? I was saying about the whole, what you were just saying in terms of how you was brought up. Um, you was brought up with respect, respect everybody, because if you respect the wrong person, something may happen. But as we are in this system, okay, of white supremacy, whatever you want to call it, okay, you have the people out here who they know, okay, he can't say nothing to me because in six minutes, I'm going to have like these Karens, you know, I, I can call the police and have them here and they'll take my side and they'll take them away. So most of the time it's the black folks who they got to play chess. If they really want to get at you, they okay. know, okay, I got to go through this system to they're, get at they're, you. Okay. I gotta, I gotta no, to no, not really. No, not really. You. No, not really. I sat here and literally, oh, okay. I sat here and literally paid thousands and thousands of dollars for bail money for the people who did need bail money for the uprisings last year. Ooh. So what I'm saying to you is power is not given. Power is taken. And when you stop, everybody else out here is playing by no damn rules. The illegals are literally throwing their kids across the border and charging into a country that they have absolutely no right or no justification to be in. And got black folks sitting up here talking about, quote, unquote, the system. The system Black folk are scared of the system. The system is supposed to be scared of us. And when we start couching things in terms of, well, let's consider what the system would like first. Everything I do is about disobedience to it. Everything. Everything. This program tonight is a testament to disobedience to it. I'm not sitting up here doing that. You talk about the Karens out there and whatnot. I bought billboards all over New York talking about what needs to be done to Karen. I didn't sit up here and try to figure out how to get along with them. I sat there and put up billboards and said, this is what we need to do to Karen. 
sat up here and had to call out Willie D's uh, fraudulent, ridiculous boot licking ass over that. So as black men, the first thing, and this is something else right here. I'm going to be straight with you here, Niren. I, I got a question for you here because I, I got a feeling. I got a feeling I, I know where that goes there. But um, by the way, for the fellas out there slanging dope and whatnot like that, um, let me find out here. Uh, what would you tell them? That there's a million ways to get paid without going the illegal route. Okay. And what would you tell Nikki Barnes? Go legit. Once I mean, he he was already um um what's his name? I forgot the guy. He was the understudy of um. No, I'm thinking of Frank Lucas. Um. Nicky Bum- Barnes. Well, I mean, he was a numbers runner. Correct? Yeah, you were saying Frank Lewis. You talking about Bumpy Johnson, but um, yeah, Bumpy Johnson. That's what I'm thinking about. Yeah, yeah. uh, no, uh, so he was the Nikki, study of um of Bumpy Johnson. Yeah, Nicky Barnes. No, that that was Frank Lucas, but uh, Nicky Barnes was a heroin dealer. So anyway, long story short, here I'm very Almost glad. Untouchable. Got I'm you. very glad. I'm very glad you said that because you know what my advice to Nicky Barnes would have been. You better get rid of Jazz and that white boy Geronimo is a snitch. That would have been my advice to Nikki Barnes. That white boy Geronimo that Jazz got hooked up with, he's a snitch. That would have been my advice to Nikki Barnes. You know why? Because I understand that the society is at war with me. And I understand that they ain't playing by no rules. So I don't approach it that way. I don't have one bit. Listen to me very carefully, Niren, and to anyone listening to me tonight who might have me confused with somebody else. And if you don't want to ever listen to my program again, anybody who doesn't like what I'm about to say next, that's up to you. I don't have the slightest bit of animosity or problem at all with a black man in America who gets it any way he can get it as long as he's not committing a violent crime against another black person. I don't. I don't have a problem with Frank Lucas, Bumpy Johnson, Nikki Barnes, Alpo, Master P, Birdman, Too Short, Easy E, nigga, please. I ain't got no problem with any of them doing whatever they got to do to level this damn playing field. I got no problem with that whatsoever. None. None. It's a crooked ass system. It's crooked against all of us. I'm not going to sit up here and hate them for what this system has made them. When as a black man today, I got black men that I'm telling got to go to CDL school and get their CDLs and get your endorsements for tankers and doubles and tractors. And meanwhile, you got damn me illegals coming across the border with trucks and no don't even got a driver's license. Joe Biden is letting them come across the border. They don't even have driver's licenses. And I'm sitting up here telling black men they got to get CDLs. And you think I'm going to sit up here and handicap them? Oh, hell no. No, y'all do what you got to do. I ain't mad at it at all. You do what you got to do. I ain't upset with Meg the Stallion. She wants to throw her draws out there and whatnot. Okay, I mean, and then you watch them niggas shooting you in the foot. Watch out for that. I'm not here. <laughs> To judge that, I think it's slutty. I'm sure not going to marry her. That ain't happening. She's not wife material. That's for damn certain. 
But I'm supposed to be mad about it and whatnot? No, I, I certainly don't think it's a good example because she's in, she's in those cases right there. It's, it's not like she's really contributing positively. But at the same time, what do you want me? Don't expect me to get super ventilated about it. That ain't happening. I have my commentary as far as in the family. Eh, I wouldn't want the girls emulating that. But I'm not going. Don't sit up here and tell me Meg the Stallion is out of bounds. But Britney Spears and, and, and Miley Cyrus shaking her little bony chicken ass. Is, is 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 legit don't tell me that if one of them's gonna get paid I prefer it to be a black woman I prefer if if, if, if somebody's gonna get paid for shaking their ass I prefer top dollar go to a black woman at least I prefer that if it's gonna go down that way And it's going to go down. So if it's going to go down that way, we might as well be running the damn thing. Might as well. Might as well. So I don't want anybody to get it twisted or confused about exactly where I'm at on this. Because as black folk, we've been taught that there's some artificial set of rules that we need to follow. And meanwhile, everybody else ain't playing by no damn rules except one. Stay on code with each other. Now that one, that rule is immutable. Everything else, okay. Nikki Barnes, when old girl came to him, when his girlfriends came to him and told him, look here, I know a bunch of chicks. They can sit up here and cut the heroin. And I know these hoes. I'll even have them in there naked so they can't steal nothing. As long as you pay them, what was he paying them? Like a thousand dollars a week or some crazy amount like that. They'll sit there and they'll have masks on. They'll cut the dope and they'll be doing it, but booty naked. So they can't steal no dope. And he paid them what a thousand dollars a week to each female. They showed up every damn day. Like they was coming to general motors, clocking in, clocking out. You think I'm upset about that? Who the hell else was paying them that? Who the hell else was? The society had every opportunity to do it and is sitting up here trying to economically starve us. And and we, we have to wait to see if a Jason Black can come along and do can come along and give you the, 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 the cheat code and crack the code and whatnot. And I'm here for that. But let's just be very, very clear about those who don't get that far. I don't have an issue with that. I really don't. And I hope there's nobody who mistakes me for someone who does, because I really don't. And I've been saying this for years and years and years. No, I do not support people walking around being inebriated or intoxicated. Um, If you're going to deal drugs, go go on the white side of town. They got more money. I will give you that little bit of advice. If you're going to do it, go over there. They got more money. Yeah, well, I'm glad that you said that because I was about to bring up Professor Black's truth when he was talking about China and the opium wars and how the whole army was inebriated and the English was able to win because of the fact that. Well, okay, but here, here's the real, you know what? I I think that's a very good point in that anybody who has not seen his commentary on that, it was absolutely groundbreaking. It was fabulous. That was fantastic. Here's the real issue. You got a bunch of defeated niggas out here. They ain't picked up a joint. (laughs) Roland Martin is defeated. That nigga wouldn't know which end of the joint to put in his mouth. Joy Reid is defeated. I can sit here all day naming off a list of niggas who are defeated already. So, yeah, drugs will defeat you. I, and as I said, just like Meg the Stallion, she ain't. I'm not going to encourage anybody to copy her. I certainly wouldn't. And let's just be very, very clear. You're mixing things because... I'm saying if you want to deal drugs, I'm not judging that. You want to use them? Eh, I, I'm I'm not gonna sign. I'm not gonna co-sign that. You certainly shouldn't use them. You certainly shouldn't use it. Far as selling it, I got no opinion. Using it, you shouldn't use it. Or. If you really want to use the opium wars analogy, the white folks sold the drugs. They wouldn't use them. So be like the British. Be like my advice, be like the British. I have no problem with that. I have no problem with turnabout being fair play. I have no problem with that at all. None. I really don't. 
And it takes a certain type of male to make it in this society. I'm not going to sit up here and judge somebody because they didn't. I'm not going to sit up here and condemn somebody because they didn't have the upbringing that I had to be able to deal with things the way that I did. Because that's not necessarily saying that what I did was right. Or was best. Me and Master P are both from Louisiana. Take a look at where he is. Take a look where I am. He's got many more millions than I do. Neither one of us is struggling, but eh, we can't compare what Jason Black did to what uh, Percy Miller did. You, 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 there's no comparison. You can't compare what Jason Black did to what Brian Birdman Williams did. There's no comparison. There really isn't. There really isn't. So which one of us was right? Which one of us was better? One of us did sold drugs. Which one of us has had more of an impact, I ask you? And that's me telling you. And I'm not saying that necessarily either one of us is wrong, but this idea that only one of us is right, I'm the one here to tell you, I can't co-sign that. We have a, as black folk, we're always being told we need to be righteous, this, that, and the other. Everybody loves slinging a Bible at us right until we remind them what they're doing to violate the Bible. Then all of a sudden, nobody wants to talk about the Bible anymore. They only want to bring up the Bible when it's a handcuff on us. Then all of a sudden, people become biblical scholars. Everybody wants to talk about righteousness and morality when that happens. I personally don't think that black males have done enough to let the society know to stop fooling with us. I personally don't think we've done enough. We have made ourselves easy targets. To the point that people literally consider us a damn joke now. You want to know how much the society doesn't fear us? I've, I've used this analogy before. Be a black male at Walmart or someplace where they're selling Xboxes or something. And try to mean mug one of them little white women if you want one of them Xboxes at the store. See how well that goes for you. See how thugged out she thinks you are. It'll be damn me, Granny Goodwill sitting up there and whatnot. You try to look intimidating if there's only one Xbox left, one iPhone left. You see how scared of you she is. With all the videos of black folk going off on people at Walmart, you see how scared and intimidated she is by your big blackness. You tell me how scared and intimidated she is. Tell me. Go ahead and show me. I'll be waiting to see that. Well, I appreciate everything that you're saying. Um, Jason Black, I'm getting off the phone now. Be one. Thank you very much for giving us a call here tonight. No, we don't need a kinder, gentler black male. We really don't. We really don't. Let me see if I can take one more phone call here. Let me get a caller from area code 754. You're on live with the business. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Okay. Caller from 754 has been abducted. Let me get a caller from area code 470. You're on live with the business. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Uh, Jeff calling from Atlanta. Jeff from Atlanta. What's on your mind? All right, so um, I actually just got out of a toxic relationship, and I wanted a little bit of advice. Um, I'm a little excited, actually, because I feel like I got my life back, and I am just want to know what steps you think I should take to improve myself and put myself on that high-value route or just not even necessarily high-value, just stable, being a productive male in society. Okay, how old are you? 27. Okay. Um, do you have any kids? No, I knew better than to do that. Okay. What do you do for a living? What do you specialize in? I don't really have a specialization. I'm a freelancer. I just started a credit repair business. I got my certification for that. And I do Uber, DoorDash, and I hustle as well. Okay, you're doing a lot there to make up for your lack of specialization. 
So we have a lot of energy <laughs> being expended that's not being expended very efficiently. Right. So uh, recently, um, I got a passenger who told me about welding. So I thought about finding some place I could start doing that. Okay. While I can you know, work on getting clients for my credit repair business, I do want to put most of my focus into that because I know that's what will be the most lucrative for me. I can put my whole heart into that because I genuinely like helping people. And I know credit is the biggest way to make an impact in someone's life. Okay. Well, credit is nice. Don't get me wrong. But I mean, how many people can you actually help with that outside of your own efforts? And that's really a relative thing. Like I say, without a lack of lacking specialty, that's going to be an issue. So what you're really trying to do is you're doing a, if the credit repair thing was really so great, you wouldn't have to be doing Uber and DoorDash simultaneously. So what I'm saying is, uh, if you got to do that, that kind of undermines the validation of the the credit thing. So what you really need to do is work on having a actual marketable skill that is reliable and is not dependent upon people messing up their finances. Right. Something that is portable and mobile and allows you to scale up is what you really need to look, take a look at. Now you sound like the kind of guy here. Are you, you ever been in the military? I actually have not. Okay. I got a bum ankle. So, Okay. Well, you sound like a, you actually sound like the kind of guy who'd be taking a look at IT, actually. And if you haven't, I just did a program on my patron that went in depth with it and whatnot. I've been getting rave reviews about it. A lot of people like that. But uh, I, I really think that's something you should take a look at. It's crazy because my first uh, vocational school I went to, I took, I took computer networking, but I transferred to automotive technology. And I finished the year in that. And I don't have a problem with that necessarily. Like I say, just understand. Um, I really do try to advise people to be careful about things that require them to use all their own labor. That it's not really something that's scalable because if it requires only your own labor, that can be an issue. So learning all the motive repair can be good, but it's really only good if you can get a lot more people to work for you. Unless of course you're just trying to do it for yourself, which is an option, but just like you got a bum ankle, you could also get a bum wrist. Yeah, I definitely would prefer to go the route of something that's a little more lucrative. I mean, I'm definitely more well-rounded in my, you know, options and skill set, and I'm always a student to everything. I'm always wanting to learn anything as far as, you know, career path. College wasn't really for me. I did try it, but I just wasn't into the whole going to college to become an employee for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. So I tried the entrepreneurial thing out. Well, I, I mean, I like that a little more. Well, it certainly is more demanding, but it can also be more rewarding. But at the same time, what I want you to do is just understand that, uh, you know, you want to, especially at the age you're at, you want to start early being able to make sure that you stockpile something that you can actually scale up because it's having the ability to scale these things that is important. That's important. We have a lot of background noise there, but thank you very much for giving us a call here tonight. Like I say, that's, that, that's definitely what you want to do is have something that you can scale up in that regard. Let me get caller from area code 312. You're on live with the business. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, my name is Zeitgeist. Calling from Chicago. Zeitgeist from Chicago. I don't think I've talked to you in a while. <laughs> uh, yeah, you remember. Yep, it's, it's been a while. You know me. What's on your mind? <laughs> yeah, so... um. Earlier today, I was I was kind of on the internet and I saw a post that kind of set me off. And uh, basically, it kind of ties into your show tonight. I see a lot of young black men trying to kind of promote this whole socialist thing. And I don't know if you see it as well, but I'm, I have like a younger black friends, and I just feel like <laughs> it's a real big problem because they think that's the solution. 
And I'm just like, white people are white people. It don't matter what system you're in. So, and I also think it's because they feel like they can't lead, so they want everybody to lead, and they want to live in community. And I think there's a part of that that kind of goes into that. So um, I basically wanted you to kind of elaborate on that. And then I wanted to ask your advice about okay. like well, building I'm, up. I'm not really like sure. I'm not really um, sure exactly. Which, I'm not really sure what you want me to elaborate on. Well, I'll say this. What is your opinion on socialism? And do you think that because a lot of black people right now, they're anti-capitalist, et cetera, which makes sense. But I fail to understand a system, a government system, that will benefit black people in any way, shape, or form. Um, so I, I just feel like socialism is kind of, uh, there's a lot of black socialists, and they feel that that's our key to freedom, and I'm just not getting it. I'm not understanding it. I don't, I don't, I don't understand what, what their whole mentality is about that. Um, and I, I just wanted your opinion on, on that. Okay, well... I think that people who are useless in the system of capitalism and unproductive in the system of capitalism will be unproductive in any system. It doesn't matter where you put them. So they think that socialism is going to get them out of or liberate them from their from the uh, requirement to produce. And that's not what will happen. Yep. They are the paupers and mm-hmm. at the bottom of the barrel in capitalism. They will likewise be at the bottom of the barrel in socialism. But that's just intellectual masturbation yeah. on their part. Yeah, yeah. Refusal to actually deal with the system that they're in and, and want to put up this pie in the sky fantasy. And I just have a huge problem with that. And I, I, feel, I really do feel like a lot of, I would say probably over 70% of the young black population has that mentality. And I talk, would pray that you do a, a, um, a show on that because, it's I don't kind have of a show. A I, I don't have a show. I have a broadcast, so I couldn't do anything broadcast. with that. My apologies. My apologies. Um, yeah, a lot of people understand, you know, um, the problems with Republicans. What was the question, you, want, what was the question you wanted to ask? Uh, in terms of myself, my personal, that was the question I had about socialism. Um, or I just, yeah, that was the question I had your opinion on and, and why it's not um, a solution for us. But in terms of my, um, my, myself, my own personal growth and development, um, what would you advise someone who's, you know, doing relatively well and looking to kind of take the next leap um, into getting finances up, getting more, more um, powerful, essentially, and, and ensuring that I am building a legacy that um, I can Maybe be proud I, of. I'm getting children. a bunch of phone calls about that tonight, so... Maybe I'll deal with that on tomorrow's program. Maybe I will deal with that in depth on tomorrow's program because I'm getting a lot of basic questions. So what this means is that some of the fundamentals of these things have not been uh, dealt with and talked about at a fundamental level. It's like some day one things have not been touched on. So, uh, you know, I think maybe I'll touch on that. Maybe I'll deal with that tomorrow night so I can have a whole program with which to, uh, we wish to address that since I've gotten a bunch of phone calls about that tonight. So um, tune back in tomorrow okay. night because I do plan on broadcasting here tomorrow. So you all have a special treat on that. I'll go ahead and broadcast, see about doing a broadcast tomorrow and we'll touch on that then. So you're welcome to give us a call back. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I'll go ahead and deal with that here because like I said, I've just been getting a lot of questions about that tonight. We've been getting people here tonight. We've been talking about toxic masculinity or supposed toxic masculinity. We've been talking about that. And it's one of those situations here where you saw the guy from Newark. And this really is what it comes down to. Okay. He thought he was going to shame me. He thought he was going to shame me by with words. He thought that he was going to intimidate me with words. You don't want to be toxic now. You being toxic now. They're being toxic. Part of manhood, which he has completely failed at, but part of manhood is understanding people's words ain't going to hurt you. And you know that you have embraced manhood when you are not sitting around 
worried about the approval or disapproval of individuals who are failing the manhood and masculinity standard. A woman doesn't set the standard for you, and a male who has obviously failed, he doesn't get a vote. You, you understand that you are succeeding at masculinity and manhood when that is the makeup of your character. That's when you start to realize and understand that's who you are. But f- fellas, we're not going to apologize anymore. We're not apologizing for being men. We're not apologizing for being abrasive. We're not apologizing. That's what makes us men. We're not apologizing for making you uncomfortable. That's what makes us men. Because we absorb all the risk. And it takes a specific type of person to absorb that risk. And if individuals wearing high heels and lipstick while he's sitting there in Newark adjusting his garter belt and and adjusting the ride of his silk panties, if individuals like him were capable of leading and were the ones desirous to lead from the front and absorb the risk, that would be different. But they're not. You live in a dirty, brutal world, and it is going to take individuals who are comfortable and can thrive in a dirty, brutal environment to be able to make that happen. And for anyone to try to slur that as being toxic, that's treasonous. I want to thank everyone who has contributed to support tonight's program, either by cash app or super chat or PayPal. I want to thank you all for doing that. It's very much appreciated. I've tried to do my best for you. I will continue to do so. We'll be back here tomorrow night. So be looking to join the same black time, same black uh, other YouTube channel. You get the idea. If you are new here to the business, welcome to the program that laid the foundation upon which all your MGTOW, red pill, high value posers and would be uh, gurus out there have all stolen, ripped off and taken everything that they got from here. We set the foundation upon which all of them are based. You heard some of that here tonight. They'll be te- they'll be rewording it and regurgitating it next week, but you heard it here first. Click that red subscribe button if you are new here. YouTube has us under one of the most oppressive, blatant shadow bans imaginable. They have literally pulled out all the stops to suppress this channel. They are even now suppressing our subscriber counts. That tells you just how afraid of what we're saying that they are. But you know what? That's good news because if you fear us, it is because we are effective. You are not afraid of us because we are not effective. You are afraid of us precisely because we are. And time is only going to give us more effectiveness. So click that red subscribe button. But most importantly, share, share, share the program. Very, very important that you do that. If you haven't joined our patron, as I was mentioning earlier in the broadcast, you're going to want to take a look at that too as well. Exclusive content that we keep over there, one-on-one discussions, gives me a lot more time to be able to do things. So you want to go ahead and take a look at that as well if you haven't considered that already. There's a reason why we have it. There's a reason why people love it. So consider joining that as well. And this concludes tonight's broadcast of The Business. I am your host, your brother, your humble servant, Mr. Jason Black. And until next time, my brothers and my sisters from around the world, remember, handle your business or your business will handle you.